and especially the staff in helping get us to this point. Uh, we've got a unique document that we're all talking about today, and I think that reflects the unique process and the way that it really listened to community and was open to solutions from folks who've been closest to the challenges and know what it'll take to fix it. I also appreciate the conversation around the dais this morning uh, and identifying you know, the real challenges and the steps that we're gonna need to go through. Certainly more community engagement and community voice and decision making helped get us here. That's gonna help drive us to the next stage. And also, we know this is a system that creates racial disparity and until we engage and grapple with you know, what the divestment in neighborhoods has gotten us to this point, we're not gonna be able to solve it as well. And so getting data and information so we can do justice reinvestment to get dollars back into the folks most impacted by these systems, you know, that's the horizon before us and we look forward to working with you on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Yes, hi, my name is Cynthia Blake and I'm with the Anti-Recidivism Coalition. I'm also a, um, in the master's program at CSUDH. Um, I am in favor for the um, ATI initiative. I myself was homeless for about 20 years with seven children, um, drug addicted, um, in this vortex of craziness that I just couldn't get out of, and I, there was nowhere to go for help. There was nowhere to go for help unless you wanted your children.
Hello? Hello? Anybody on? Hi, Sachi, we can hear you loud and clear. Thank Hi, you. Sachi, a bunch of us are on. Okay, thank you. I'm on, Hilda's on, thanks. That's Sheila. Morning, everyone. Welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors. Today is Tuesday, May 12th, 2020. Our meeting today is being held remotely due to the current public health crisis to protect the health of all. I will now take roll call to confirm attendance. Please unmute your mic and respond when your name is called. Supervisor Solis. Present. Supervisor Ridley Thomas. I'm so good. Supervisor Ridley Thomas. Supervisor Kuehl. I'm here. Supervisor Hahn. Here. Sachi Hamai, Chief Executive Officer. I'm here, present. Mary Wickham, County Council. Present. Celia Zavala, Executive Officer of the Board. Present. As indicated on the posted agenda, we will be taking telephonic public comments during today's meeting. We will also read in the names and positions of those who submitted written comments on items held by supervisors. The Executive Office of the Board received over 400 written public comments for today's meetings. And as those written comments were received, all of them were available to the supervisors for their consideration, consistent with the Brown Act's requirements. We will continue to receive public comments throughout the meeting. Madam Executive Officer, please call the agenda. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. Today's agenda will begin on page two. This is the agenda for the Los Angeles County Development Authority. On page four, consent calendar, Board of Supervisors, items one through eight. On item one, this includes a re revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item three, Supervisor Kuehl would like to amend Directive 2 to include all tenants in the county and Directive 3B to extend the moratorium to evictions of residential or commercial tenants, respectively, who are affected by COVID-19 and located in unincorporated county cities whose local eviction moratoria do not extend to the type of tenancy. Also on this item, Supervisor Barger requests that this item be held there's an amendment for this item will be available online. On item four, Supervisor Kuehl requests that this item be held. On item six, Supervisor Hahn requests that this item be held. This item includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item nine, Supervisor Hahn requests that this item be referred back to her office as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item 15, Supervisor Solis and Supervisor Kuehl request that this item be held. This includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. 
on item 17. This includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item 16, I'm sorry, on page 16, administrative matters, items 19 through 53. On item 19, Supervisor Barger requests that this item be continued to July 21st, 2020, as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item 20, the Chief Executive Officer requests that this item be continued to October 27th, 2020, as indicated on the posted agenda. On item 37, the Inspector General requests that this item be continued to June 9th, 2020, as indicated on the posted agenda. On page 34, this includes miscellaneous addition to the agenda, which were posted more than 72 hours in advance of the meeting, as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item 51A, Supervisor Billy Thomas requests that this item be held. On item 51B, Supervisor Hahn requests that this item be held. This item relates to 51G and 51H. On item 51G is an ordinance for introduction amending county code Title VIII Consumer Protection Business and Wage Regulation by adding a chapter and establishing a right of recall for janitorial maintenance, security service, and hospitality workers who are laid off as a result of COVID-19 pandemic public health crisis. On this item, Supervisor Hahn requests that this item be held. This item relates to item 51B and 51H. On item 51H is an ordinance for introduction of many county code title eight, consumer protection business and wage regulation by adding a chapter and establishing legal protection for workers to be retained when certain specified businesses change ownership or control. On item 51H, Supervisor Hahn requests that this item be held. This item relates to 51B and 51G. The request for continuances and items to re be referred back are before you. Thank you. Um, with that, we're going to take public comment. Um, I'm sorry, moved by Supervisor Hahn, seconded by Supervisor Solis, without objection, so ordered. Also on page 34, notices of closed session, items CS1 and CS2 are additions as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On page 37, items continue from previous meetings for further discussion and action by the board. I'm sorry. A1, on I, item A1, Supervisor Riley Thomas and Supervisor Barger request that this item be held. Also, the motion is available online. That completes the reading of the agenda, Madam Chair. Thank you. We will now take public comments. Madam Executive Officer, please read the call-in information that was also provided on the agenda. As indicated on the agenda, members of the public wishing to offer public comments should call 844-921 six three five five and use the participant code number nine eight two three five nine eight to repeat please call eight four four two nine one six three five five and use participant code number nine eight two three five nine eight thank you madam executive officer Please explain, explain our speaking rules to those members of the public who are calling in to address the board. To members of the public calling in, when it is your turn to speak, please state your name and which I agenda item you wish to speak on. You have one minute to speak on one agenda item and two minutes to speak on two or more agenda items. In addition, those who would like to address the board with general public comment will be provided one additional minute for a maximum total of three minutes per person for all agenda items, including general public comment. We will allocate up to 60 minutes for public comment on all of the items. If there are no speakers waiting before 60 minutes have elapsed, we will close public comment. We will continue to accept all written comments that come in during the meeting, which will be part of the record. When speaking on the agenda item, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you are not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell if you're speaking on an agenda item, you will get one warning from county council or the chair. If you do not immediately <clears throat> or clearly get on topic, or if you stray off topic again, you will forfeit the rest of your time and the chair will move to the next speaker. Please note that if you are also listening to the board meeting on a computer or speaker phone, you will need to turn down the volume on those devices as soon as the moderator calls on you. If you do not turn down the volume, 
there will be an echo. Mr. Moderator, maybe we have our first speaker, please. Absolutely. And as a reminder for public comments, please do press one, then zero at this time. We do need you to press one, then zero to place your line in queue. We do have participants that are now queuing up with that prompt. Please do stand by. We'll repeat that prompt so we could get you into queue at this time. One, then zero. One, then zero. And our first uh, participant will be Gabrielle Seward with United Parents and Students. Please go ahead. Good morning. Hello, this is Gabrielle Seiwert. Can you, um, what agenda item are you speaking on? Uh, agenda item 54, general public comment. Go ahead, you have a one minute, please. Thank you. Um, good morning, the, uh, my name is Gabrielle Seiwert and I'm a community engagement coordinator with United Parents and Students, uh, which is a nonprofit that works um, with parents and students all over Los Angeles, um, serving over 10,000 families. Um, and I'm submitting public comment this morning on behalf of the dozens of you know, mothers and fathers and grandparents and students that I've talked to over the past few weeks. Um, we've been making calls to people and doing outreach to connect them with different resources that they need. Um, and one of the things that I've been hearing over and over again is just the need for more food security in Los Angeles. Um, this has already been a problem, you know, before the pandemic even started with one in five residents unsure of where their next meal would come from, you know, before COVID-19 even hit us. So now when I speak with these people, there, there's just such a concern for where these meals are going to come from, and especially for students who are still trying to go to school and, um, you know, make sure that they can do distance learning and, and the many things that are difficult during this time. Thank you. So Your time has have. expired. May we go to the next speaker, please? And thank you. And we'll go directly to the line. We'll go right now to the line of John Nelson. John Nelson, you have a line that is open right now. Speaker, what item are you? And John, take yourself off mute if you're on mute, John. John, we have you live. Please go ahead, state your, uh, the agenda that you'll be speaking on. Uh, speaker, that line disconnected. We'll move on to Sparky Abraham with, um, that will be Belzadek Legal Service. Please go ahead, you have a live line. Good morning, good morning board. I'm speaking on item number 15, please. My name is Sparky Abraham. Um, I'm a staff attorney. Uh, with the real estate fraud at BetSedek Legal Services. I work both with our elder justice team and with our impact team. Uh, I'm calling in support of the motion to direct a report back on both deferment and suspension of the PACE program during the crisis. I wanna emphasize that for deferment, many of our clients who are seniors are relying on family financial support during this time. And many of their families have been furloughed or lost jobs due to the crisis meaning that a lot of people are facing the possibility of foreclosure due to their PACE obligations. And I also would like to emphasize in terms of suspending the program that the PACE program does require at-home visits, oftentimes to senior citizens from contractors and strangers, putting lots of people at increased risk of infection. And so I would like to voice that that strong support of both deferment of obligations and also suspension of the PACE program during the, this emergency. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And next we'll go to the line of Stephanie uh, Carroll. Please go ahead. Thank you to the board. My name's Stephanie Carroll. What calling, item are you speaking on, ma'am? I'm calling in support of item 15 on behalf of public council. Um, we are in support please. of item 15, especially as it concerns the PACE program. We heard yesterday that the county has decided to discontinue its own paid program. And while we applaud that move is true, there are still thousands of homeowners with case liens on their homes in LA County. Liens often procured by fraud and many with no work done at all. Those people cannot afford and could never afford to pay those loans. Our clients often come to us when they've spent through their life savings, depleted all their family's resources, 
come out of retirement or taken second or even third jobs to pay these high interest subprime loans. In the current crisis, all those income sources have dried up, and that means our clients, almost all of whom have mortgages, will end up in foreclosure. It is not enough to forgive tax penalties. If those taxes are not deferred, our clients' mortgage companies will step in and pay those taxes and foreclose. We entreat the board to support this motion and do all it can to assist homeowners who have fallen victim to pay. Thank you. Thank you. Next item, please. Next speaker. And next we'll go to the line of Lisa Marquez. Please go ahead and state the items that you'll be speaking on. Yes, items three and 15, item three first. I'm against this agenda item. Um, we have been providing affordable housing to renters in our community for over 40 years. We have put our life savings and devotion into our renters. Um, this would be a detriment to us. Um, I don't want to explain to my 94 year old mother who is in an assisted living on lockdown that her entire life's work has been defeated by these agenda items, by these considerations. I'd like to speak on 15. Go ahead. Um, I think this is a violation of our constitutional rights. My parents came to this country over 60 years ago as immigrants, and they work six days a week, every week, saving everything um, for their, their property. Um, their bread and butter buildings that have provided affordable housing to tenants for over 40 years, many years never raising rents on the tenants, establishing good relationships. Now, I don't want to explain to my 94 year old mother that her life's work could possibly be taken away from her. The, um, the bread and butter buildings that she owns be, be forced to be sold. Um, I'm the surviving child and I am managing my parents' affairs and their business affairs. And this is, this is a violation, violation of our constitutional rights, what my parents came to this great country for. And to, to consider agenda item 15 that, that these, these properties be taken from us. It's just, it's very unfair to place this entire burden on the land. Time has it. Your time is up. Next speaker, please. And next we'll go to the line of Natalie uh, Godinez, self-help graphic. Please state the items that you will be uh, speaking on. And also if you will be speaking on public comments, please go ahead. Hello, my name is Natalie Godinez. I am calling in support of the Healthy LA platform um, and from Self-Help Graphics. Um, we support item 15. Um, we support comprehensive relief for low-income homeowners, for good mom and pop landlords, and for tenants. Um, this will help us prepare for the uh, disruption in the housing market that will uh, cause a lot, of, uh, a lot of pain and a lot of, a lot of problems for the people of Los Angeles, especially low-income people. And we also uh, would like that the item passes all together um, because the item calls for report back that will help the board plan to address um, this differently. And then this will help us not be treated the same way as we were treated in the 2008 housing collapse. Um, thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And next we'll go to the line of Rabia Sen, Esperanza Community Housing Corporation. Please state the items that you'll be speaking on and also if you'll be speaking with on public comments. Please go ahead. Yes, hi. Um, I'm speaking to item number 15. Um, 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 uh, we work alongside the communities of South Central Los Angeles. And what we see is most of our tenants and indeed most of the residents in the area, they're low wage workers who now find themselves without a job, they're struggling to pay rent, to pay for basic needs and keep a roof over their head. And in short, because of this pandemic, they're bearing an inordinate amount of the burden of the economic fallout and now facing a whole new displacement threat because of this pandemic. The fact is to have a just and economic recovery, we cannot leave these communities behind. We cannot therefore have a repeat of the response to the 2008 collapse that led 
to the homelessness and housing crisis before this pandemic and that's intensifying now. Therefore, we support comprehensive relief for low-income homeowners, for good mom and pop landlords and tenants. It's all needed to ensure that just and sustainable recovery. And to do this, we need all of item 15 to be passed and to be passed together and not split apart. It's a motion that's radical only in that it provides that comprehensive approach that we've always needed, calling for report backs on various connected parts to Time ensure is that up. the county's recovery plan helps everyone. Next speaker, please. And thank you. We'll go directly to the line of Tanya Love, homeowner district five. Please state items that you'll be speaking on and also on your public comments. Good morning. I'm speaking on part four of item 15. I'm a homeowner in district five and I have a PACE loan on my property that's caused me to have an additional 400, excuse me, $4,884 to my annual property tax bill since 2016. I was already struggling with it and now with the pandemic, I have no way to, to pay anything right now because currently I'm unemployed. I'm really worried about the ability to continue making my property tax payments and to keep my home. I urge Supervisor Bart and the Board of Supervisors to support part four of item 15. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And next we'll go to the line of uh, Brady uh, Collins and Brady Collins with the Korean Town Immigrants Workers Alliance. Please state the items that you'll be speaking of on and also public comments. Uh, items three, four, six, seven, 15, and 51B. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, I'm a resident of District 2 and work with the Koreatown Immigrant Workers Alliance, which is also part of the Healthy LA Coalition. I'm calling to ask that you support all of these items, three, four, six, seven, all of 15 and 51B. Passing just one of these is not enough. Addressing the pandemic requires a multi-pronged strategy because of the ways that all of these issues intersect. We need to make sure that this crisis does not exacerbate the existing underemployment, housing, and homelessness crises. We also need to recognize that LA County's low-wage workers and renters are the backbone of our economy. I support the Healthy LA platform and urge you all to as well, which means defending tenants' rights to remain in a healthy home and workers' rights to get their jobs back. It means ensuring those experiencing homelessness are included in our recovery efforts, and it means the county leverages its position as a client of big banks and only does business with those that work with homeowners to pass rent relief. I urge you to support the Healthy LA platform and pass these measures so that we can truly recover from this pandemic. Thank you for your support and your leadership. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And next we'll go line up Michael Racanelli, Chateau uh, Marmont. Uh, please state the items that you'll be speaking on and also the public comments. Please go ahead. Hi there, I'm speaking on 51B, G, and H. Um, I was terminated from my hotel job, the Chateau Marmont, uh, back in March, along with about 200 of my coworkers. Um, I'm still struggling to pay rent. Um, I have a I have family back in Chicago. My mother is disabled with after a kidney transplant. Uh, I help support her. My sister is a single mother of two children. I help her as well. Um, I have a lot of coworkers that worked for 30 or 40 years that are also struggling um, to make ends meet. Um, and we uh, fought to have the ordinances passed for worker uh, right of recall and retention in LA City recently. All 15 of the council members unanimously voted for it. Um, and I just wanted to call and uh, hope that you would support uh, these ordinances to apply to all of LA County and its 10 million residents to afford the same protections to them as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And next we'll go line of uh, Lun uh, Pla uh, Planbeck with Santa Clarita Organization for Planning and the Environment. Please state the items that you'll be speaking on and if you're speaking on public comments, go ahead. Item 36, the Mission Village final map approval of Newhall Ranch project and public comment. Item 36 first, it, it sounded like you have already approved this before public comments were allowed to be made. 
And uh, we've opposed this project for a really long time, as you know. We're very concerned about the sufficiency of the water supply out here. We've had almost 40% of our wells closed down due to PFAS pollution. And um, not to look at the water supply again or do a water supply assessment and continue to approve these massive projects is just inconscionable. Uh, we depend on our groundwater for about 50% of our water supply, which means with that many wells closed down, we have about 28% of our water supply is being impacted. And now I want to speak on public comment. Um, the way you are doing this is not sufficient to meet the Brown Act. Uh, many of us have really serious concerns. We have information to bring to the board that is legitimate and, and to the point of what we are talking about and things, they are things that you wouldn't know. There's no way for us to even know if you're reading our comments uh, because you don't discuss any of the matters. Um, when I first started being involved in environmental issues in the late 90s and early 2000s, you used to have two board meetings a week, and I would suggest that you go back to that so you have sufficient time to listen to the public, too. And also, I would want to suggest that you convene a um, committee or something of people that make public comments and see if we can find a way together that would be more um, observant of the Brown Act and really be able to bring you things again. It used to be that when we came down and made the effort to come to the Board of Supervisors meeting, we could actually speak to the board and have adequate time. Time has but expired. Thank you. And a point for clarification on consent items, the board has not taken um, a vote on it. Uh, we're listening to public comment first, and then we'll take a vote on the consent items. Also, Supervisor Riley Thomas um, are, is online as well. Um, next speaker, please. And next speaker will go to the line of Jana Breslaw. Please state the items that you'll be speaking on and if you'll be speaking on the public comments. Please go ahead. And Jonah may have taken herself out of uh, queue. We will move to the line of uh, Suzanne Partovi. Please go ahead and state the items that you'll be speaking on. Hi, um, I'd like to speak on item number four. Um, my name is Dr. Susan Partovi. I'm the medical director for Homeless Healthcare Los Angeles. Um, I've been working uh, with the homeless population for about 16 years, um, and I continue to do street medicine today. Um, and one of the things that I've been saying, whether I write an article about it or I'm being interviewed about it, is that the key to curing the homeless situation, though in the long run is um, permanent supportive housing, it's taking too long. And so what's happening is that we're losing, especially our vulnerable people, um, either through death or through incarceration um, or near death, and they're being put into nursing homes. So I have m multiple examples of that. And so the answer really, especially for our vulnerable people, that we're, we're putting people into Tier 1 housing uh, uh, because they're considered Your vulnerable. Up. Your time is up. Next speaker, please. Thank you, Doctor. And our next speaker will go to the line of Joseph uh, Mazlich. Please state the items that you will be speaking on and also your public comments. Please go ahead. And Joseph, you have a live line. Hello? Go ahead, sir. Yes. State, the, state the items okay. that you'll be speaking on. You do have a live line. Yes, yes. Uh, well, I just said I'll, I'll repeat it. Uh, 51A, 51B, and a public comment, a general public comment. Hello? Go ahead, uh, Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Um, on 51A, um, uh, congratulations, really, on, on the boards considering this. It may actually have the effect of accelerating the um, alternatives to incarceration that uh, that was uh, 
um, you know, been worked on and that the board has uh, supported the recommendations of. And uh, these things fit together just like this fits with the uh, uh, Judicial Council uh, pilot program. Uh, there's some special opportunities here, too, um, mentioning negotiation, possibly negotiation of case outcomes during the period of release. Uh, that's pretty important, and it actually could help restore a, a right to trial because people who are on release in these programs um, will have a better uh, opportunity. They won't be under the pressures of being in custody, and so that may actually get us what it says in the constitutional amendment about the right to trial. So congratulations on considering this, and I, I hope to watch it go forward successfully. On 51B, um, uh, I would like to see this uh, this measure include some study of how to apply this in other industries besides the janitorial and uh, that kind of services, which are mentioned explicitly. But really, every worker uh, needs to have some right of uh, restoration to employment when the business situation changes, and uh, that would actually remove a lot of stress for people both employed and unemployed and really help the atmosphere in the county that's related to uh, work and all the people who are dependent on work for their livelihoods. Um, my general public comment is uh, I'd like the board to consider still further improvements in the um, public comment and the public involvement in the development, actually, of proposals and measures. Um, the board does not have its, its combined legislature and executive. It doesn't have hearings on some of the specific or some of the major issues, um, although they may come before the board a couple of times. But I would suggest considering legislative hearings like most localities do and all the states do and the federal government does, hearings on uh, several related items, uh, and so the public could watch the development of those, have more notice, earlier notice, and I think put in more productive and useful comment. So I'd like that uh, so to be considered. I, I know it would be a change in the way that you've been working, but this will allow for better co uh, collaboration and probably better implementation of the measures that are adopted and, uh, and less alienation between the board and the public of the county. I've written that in as a written comment also, and I hope to uh, watch how that's considered. Our Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And next we'll go to the line of uh, Alsa Sanchez. Say the agenda item, and if you have the public comments, please go ahead. Hi, uh, uh, Elsa Sanchez with item 15, um, uh, public comments. Um, like I said, my name is Elsa Sanchez. Uh, my father is elderly. He's monolingual Spanish speaker, homeowner who lives in District 2. And we are in support of Part 4 of Item 15, deferring the pay taxes by at least 12 months. My father has a county pay lien on his home that has increased his annual taxes by 4,600 since 2017. The only reason my father participated in the program uh, was because he was lied to about how much it would cost. Now he has been forced to postpone his retirement. He is 69 and he keeps working six days a week in a physically demanding dangerous job to pay his face, pays taxes on his home. Due to the virus, I've been out of work since March 20 and I am unable to help him financially. I strongly urge the Supervisor Riley Thomas and the Board of Supervisors to support uh, for on item 15 and defer the pays taxes by at least a year. Thank you. Thank and one, and thank you. And once again, as a reminder, please do press one, then zero. You will be asked to state the agenda items that you'll be speaking on, and also any public comments. At this time, we'll go to the line of Veronica Toledo. Please go ahead. Uh, this is general public comment. My name is Veronica Toledo, and I'm the associate director of United Parents and Students, which, as Gabby said earlier, is a nonprofit organization that serves over 10,000 families in LA County. Our organization, in collaboration with the LA Food Policy Council, American Heart Association, Community Health Councils, Parent Revolution, Educators for Excellence, Inclusive Action, and Haven Neighborhood Services, strongly urge the county to, together with philanthropic partners, develop a $5 million fund to provide emergency grocery vouchers for low-income families in unincorporated areas that have been financially impacted by COVID, including those not currently being served by traditional DPSS programs. 
A poll released by Education Trust West recently found that 41% of LA parents with young children had skipped or reduced their own meals due to food insecurity caused by COVID. For example, one parent living in East LA told me she had no choice but to restrict the family's food intake throughout the day to be sure they could get through the week. This is a matter of life and death for thousands and the time is now for the board to act. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And next we'll go to the line of April Sims. Please go ahead, say the agenda items and a public comment. Great morning. I'm calling regarding the closure, the proposed closure of the Marina Del Rey Sierra Station. I am representing Simply Wholesome, which is a business entity that's been an anchor at the intersection of Slauson and Overhill for over 35 years. My family has also resided in this community since 1973. I and we implore the county supervisors not to close the Marina Del Rey Sierra Station. This station provides an absolutely, it provides a uh, need for public safety to our business, our customers, our staff of over 34 souls, and our community. We respectfully request and ask that the board and sheriff's department look to a portion cuts across the board to fairly and equitably have all citizens absorb the reduced funding. Thanks in advance for your careful and thoughtful consideration. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next, we'll go to the line of Eric uh, Preven. Please go ahead, uh, say the agenda items and if public comments. Mr. Previn, you have a live line. It's Eric Previn from Studio City, and I'll speak on, uh, to make it simple, all of the items, uh, I'll do my best, and obviously a general public comment for the total three minutes. So for starters, um, you know, I applaud the board for coming to their senses and at least inviting the public to participate in a limited way. I think as Lynn Plembeck, Joe Mazlish, and others have mentioned, it's essential that you reach out to the public and come up with a go forward that includes public input. As Lynn mentioned, there are um, there were two meetings a week in the past, and we are now featuring budget time. Budget time is a time of extraordinary importance in county government and also city government because there's so many decisions that have to be made, and in this post-COVID um, nightmare, which can be described as a very grim and bleak area. The, and then what item are you speaking on? I was, well, I was speaking about, I mean, I was speaking about the budget and w which is, you know, included in my general public comment, I suppose, but I could go right to the Marina Del Rey item 2712R, which is a county parcel that uh, is being flipped by a couple of LLCs. Uh, for $273 million is the price tag. Now, the county who owns this land uh, is only going to see $13 million uh, of that. Now, you may, well, how's that possible if we're the owners and such a big transaction is taking place? It's a very good question. Now, this is in the marina where the sheriff and the county board of supervisors have been quibbling with one another, and they are alleging that there's a $400 million shortfall and the sheriff is going to have to shut the Marina Del Rey Sheriff Station down in Altadena. Um, this is really becoming tiresome, the way there seems to be a lack of cooperation between the board and the sheriff. I think it's really hurting uh, the go forward. Item 51F is, if you can believe it, an increase uh, by $13.6 million. We are going to jack up to $26 million total the voting solutions for all people tally system. Now this was the debacle and it's also a source that rolled out during our last election period where we had horrible, it was eclipsed by the COVID story. But now I thought the governor's announced we're doing everything vote by mail. So this contract ought to be checked. I don't understand why we would be doing that right now. It makes no sense to me. Um, I'd also like to mention that the PACE liens and loans issue, the county should really consider these people are being strangled by the net that's intending to help them and that is not acceptable in any in any way and i'd also like to know just because i mentioned it a minute ago the voters solution for all why is there so little information about a digital foundry the company that allegedly is going to benefit by all this also you've got an rfp going out for job order contracts once again i just advise you that these are contracts that are hard to bid on anyway because of the complicated Gordian Group's tentacles. But this is going to be another rollover of $35 million of contracts to the same usual customers, which I don't think is speaker, in. Please. 
and thank you. Our next speaker will go to the line of Genevieve Clorel. Once again, uh, say the agenda items, that, and if you have public comments, please go ahead. Yes, uh, Dr. Genevieve Clorel, <clears throat> on item 11, I think it's a very good plan. I think it will be better if we know more about it. Just want to make sure that all the hazards are taken into consideration. On item 16, uh, I am in favor of ratifying the executive order about the litigation against Norwalk, Bell Garden, etc., and so on. It is uh, distressing that they do not want to protect the homeless in the uh, district. Then on item uh, 29, I am totally in favor of that project. The sooner it's done, the better it will be for everybody. We really need that medical campus in function. Thank you so much. That's it. And next we'll go to Brianna uh, Jordan. Say the agenda items and in public comments. And that person may have taken themselves out of queue. So at this time, we'll move to Jamie Garcia. Jamie Garcia, go ahead at this time and say the agenda items and if public comments. Uh, good morning, Jaime Garcia with the Hospital Association of Southern California. And I'm speaking regarding um, item 51B. The Hospital Association on behalf of over 90 hospitals and health systems is pleased for the opportunity to provide input on the right of recall and worker retention ordinance. And I'm speaking to request a full exemption of all hospitals, regardless of their tax status. As written, the employer definition in the ordinance exempts government and nonprofit entities. It excludes investor-owned hospitals that serve the front line, protecting county residents each and every day. These community-based providers often are located in underserved communities, such as East Los Angeles, and serve a high volume of low-income and uninsured patients. Many of these facilities are also classified as dish facilities. They are bound by the same federal laws and regulations, as well as state regulations, as nonprofit and public hospitals. They have proven to be essential providers as we continue to fight the COVID pandemic, and they should receive the same exemption as nonprofit entities. So in closing, PASS respectfully request that the Board of Supervisors extend the exemption to all hospitals and their clinics, regardless of their tax status, given their shared responsibility to their local communities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And next, uh, next we'll go to the line of, um, we have a Jamie Garcia that just finished there. One moment. We'll go on to Jonah Brissot. Please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, and say the agenda item and if pu public comments. Yes, uh, public comments and also for 51 uh, B, G, and H. Uh, my name is Jonah Breslau. I'm calling, I used to be a hospitality worker myself, and I think it's really important in this time that we pass strong protections for workers uh, in the hospitality and building services industries. Uh, you know, I'm calling to support permanent and retroactive uh, worker retention and right of recall policies for these workers. Since March, tens of thousands of Angelinos have lost their jobs in these industries, and when these industries rehire, uh, they should absolutely give uh, these workers their jobs back. Thank you for your support and please adopt these ordinances today. Thank you. And thank you. once and thank you. And once again, as a reminder, um, if you wish uh, for any type of comments, please do press one then zero at this time. And next we'll go to the line of Erica Copeland, say the agenda items and if public comments. Okay. Hello? You have a live line, go ahead. All right, Copeland. thank you. Hi, my name is Erica Copeland and I'm speaking on item 54 general comment. I am a resident of district two and I work as a community organizer with United Parents and Students working primarily with families in South Los Angeles many of whom have been hard hit by the COVID crisis. Uh, many families have lost jobs and they also have children to care for around the clock due to school closures. So families not only worry about paying for bills, but also a more primal need, which is hunger. Uh, one single mother that I spoke with is homeless living in her car. Her mother helps her by allowing her two children to sleep inside her house at night, so at least they stay safe. 
um, and her food stamps have been cut to a meager sum. So were it not for her mother, she doesn't know how she would feed her children. Uh, so in this light, I encourage the county board to develop a $5 million fund to provide emergency grocery vouchers, um, particularly for low-income families that have been hard hit by COVID um, in unincorporated areas. Uh, please act now. Our families cannot afford to wait. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll go to the line of John Nelson, say the uh, agenda items and if public comments. Please go ahead. Oh, thank you so much. This is uh, item 54, general public comment. Um, I want to thank the supervisors for protecting our health during this difficult time. My uh, comment is regarding the resumption of racing at Santa Anita. Uh, Governor Newsom and the CHRB has already allowed horse racing to continue in the state. And I think that this county needs to get racing going to avoid a humanitarian crisis. There's seven, 800 people that live back there that don't really have a voice. If seven, 800 people from our county, which has the most COVID cases, are displaced to other counties and other places, that's a humanitarian and a health crisis. So we need to resume horse racing as allowed by the governor. And also the county is missing out on a lot of revenue because there's not many racetracks running right now. If Santa Anita, if and when resumes, there will be a windfall of substantial amounts of money that will be tax revenue for the county at this difficult time. So once again, thank you so much to all the county uh, officials and workers for doing such a great job during this difficult time. Have a great day. And thank you. Next we'll go line of a Roberto uh, Guzman say the agenda items and if public comments. Uh, item 54. Go ahead, please. Yes, my name is Roberto Guzman and I'm a community organizer for United Parents and Students. And I am urging the board to develop a $5 million fund to provide emergency uh, grocery vouchers for low-income families in incorporated areas. Uh, this is due to the hundreds of calls that are made to families uh, during this pandemic. And many of them are telling me, you know, they have to choose between uh, paying bills, rent, or buying food for their families. I, I think um, our board and our organizations working for families uh, should do better, and we definitely can do better. Uh, please develop uh, this $5 million fund to, to help these families and our residents. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll go to the line of Brianna Jordan. Please go ahead, say the agenda items and if public comments. Yes, good morning. Item 54, general public comment. Um, so like I said, my name is Brianna Jordan. I'm a youth organizer with United Parents and Students. And as a youth organizer, I work with hundreds of students across the county, including unincorporated areas. Our organization, in partnership with several others, strongly urges the county to leverage public-private relationships to develop a $5 million fund to provide emergency vouchers, grocery store vouchers for low-income families in unincorporated areas. Um, I work with many students who have shared their stories of how COVID-19 has had impacted their communities. For example, one student in East Los Angeles shared how the tap water in their community has been contaminated for some time and is not suitable for drinking. Therefore, they spend a significant amount of money on bottled water for the family and often have to go to several stores to even find any water in stock. Um, another student in South Central LA shared that she lives in a household of two families with 11 people living in the household. Um, because of COVID-19, none of the adults, including herself, are able to work anymore, um, and they need significant support immediately to be able to survive. Um, so this fund would offer very significant and necessary relief to thousands of families across the county, and we urge you Thank you. Your time support. is up. Next speaker, please. And thank you. Next, we'll go to Scarlett De Leon. Please say the agenda item and if public comment. Scarlett. And Ms. Scarlett, you may have taken yourself out of queue. One moment. We'll go directly to the line of uh, Jeremy uh, Pennock. Uh, please go ahead and say your agenda item and if pu public comment. Thank you. Uh, good morning to the Board of Supervisors. My name is Jeremy Pennock, and I'm a constituent living in Koreatown. I'm in the district of Mark Ridley Thomas. I'm also a volunteer and community organizer with the Democratic Socialists of America, Los Angeles. Uh, I would like to comment on tenant, homeowner, and small business protections. That would be items number three, six, seven, and 15. 
So I uh, do strongly support the Healthy LA platform. Uh, I'm worried that this health crisis will become a long-term eviction and economic crisis. Uh, I do urge you to defend my right and my neighbor's rights to a healthy, safe home and protect our businesses. Um, you must extend the eviction moratorium and issue rent forgiveness for all tenants and support motions for anti-harassment and tenants' private right of action. Um, as a previous key witness in a lawsuit alleging a real estate firm here in Los Angeles pressured Latino and mentally disabled tenants to leave its rent-controlled Koreatown building so that it could raise the rent and eventually it agreed to pay millions to settle that federal suit, I am genuinely afraid that without stronger protections, you are leaving members of our community at great risk of similar dangers by predatory companies that are trying to take advantage of this crisis. Um, I do thank you for your time and your leadership. Thank you. And next we'll go to line of Luis Moreno, say the agenda items and if public comments. Hello, good morning. Good morning, you have a live line. Please go ahead. Okay, my name is Mr. Moreno. I'm supporting item 61B, 61G, and 61H. I worked for Chateau Marmont for 19 years in the gardening department, and I was fired because of COVID-19 without any benefit. I live in the city of Lingwood for eight years. I'm worried because I have to pay my mortgage, my health insurance for my family, and I have to help my son who is in college. Please pass the call and the attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Next you. speaker, please. Next, we'll go to line of George uh, Bazelli. Say the agenda items and if public comments at this time. Items 19, 37, and public comment. Go ahead, please. Okay. On 19, I've pointed out to you for the last year and a half that you're spending five to seven hundred thousand per homeless unit. And I gave you a bid from giant containers for 65,000 each, and I have them down to 40,000 now. You brag about ho housing 3,362 people over six years for $1.7 billion. When I hit Phil Ansel with that, Phil Ansel runs out of the room and down the hall. Now, why are you continuing to pork people out instead of actually putting people in housing and stopping this madness? Not of the sheriff and the OIG. You all well know my work with Sheriff Bach as director of policy for the Congress of Racial Equality of California with Celeste King IV for eight years. Not a bill got passed in California without our work. Every time the sheriff needed somebody there at the Board of Supervisors, we showed up. Do you remember? Do you remember me shutting down your jail? Shutting down Measure J for $300 billion. And now you're running your illegal board meetings into public comment, okay? Do you not have letters from me on cease and desist and null and void? Has the 30 days not passed on the first one now going to the DA because you refuse to respond to any public information request or any legal submission to you at all? You're running a lawless meeting as you are right now and have been. You have the letter from me yesterday on your trying to run an illegal budget meeting tomorrow with no material. Public, go up and look at the agenda that doesn't exist and go to attachments. Am I not correct, Borden? So we're gonna find out how crooked this whole place really is. Do you hear me, people? You're committing crimes. Under 549, 53.3, you can't ask our name to speak. You've been breaking the law for years. We're going to hold you accountable, and we're going to find out how crooked this place is because you people are not liberal, nor are you progressive. You are Trumpsters. Your actions show it by the way you're running these meetings. 
Beverly Hills has run meetings with phone in calls for 15 years, people. Even the Supreme Court was able to do it. You're a bunch of losers. And it's time you're held accountable to the law. And Bye. Speaker, I think your time is up. We'll move directly to the line of Patricia Not Russell. Not bad timing, huh, bud? That's a pro. I like that. Thank you. And we'll next we'll move to Patricia Russell. Patricia Russell, please go ahead, say the agenda item and if public comments. <laughs> Agenda item is 15, a few others regarding uh, tenants and uh, landlords. I'm a landlady, I'm a senior. But it just I'm in Chicago. I have four rental properties with my yeah, sole income. I don't get so well, because I'm not. This is um, public. Can somebody hear me? Is, it, is this working? We could hear you. There's some background noise, uh, Ms. Russell. Please do continue. It's not my background. I don't know whose background that is. But they mute their phone because it's not fair to me. I can't even talk when it's. Thank you. I just want to ask the board to consider landlords, mom and pop landlords. Right now, I'm missing half my income. I'm not able to pay my mortgages. I run the risk of losing my only income and becoming homeless myself. I'm having a hard time even having enough. For food, and I pray and hope that you can help them as well, because otherwise we could go under. We're not all corporations; we're not all all bad people. But it's kind of hurt people, you know what I'm saying? We're people, and I just hope that we could get them help soon because it's a great deal of emotional stress for a lot of mother, mom and pop landlords who are not getting rent right now. Through no fault of their own as well. Thank you. And thank you. And at this time, if you wish any public comments or stating your agenda items, please press one then zero. We'll place your line into queue. So you'll need to press one then zero. And at that time, we'll ask you when we introduce you to uh, say the agenda items and a public comment. At this time, we'll go directly to the line of uh, Veronica Jaru, and um, once again, say the agenda items and if public comments. And be advised, we do have a time a time constraint on your uh, comments. Hi, um, I'm talking on yeah, item number three. Uh, I wanted to say that I strongly support the Healthy LA platform, and I'm urging you all to defend my right to a healthy and safe home and extend the eviction moratorium and issue rent forgiveness for all tenants and support motions for anti-harassment and tenants' private right of action. I work as a hairdresser and I'm gonna be one of the last groups to be able to go back to work. Not only that, but my partner has also had his income reduced by more than half. He's working from home and as of June, we owe more than $4,200 of rent. While my intention is to pay back all that money, I don't know how long that's gonna take or when we're gonna able to have an economically stable economy for me to go back to work and be able to make the money for a living wage. The small businesses in my neighborhood also need protection. I'm extending, and to extend the moratorium for six months would be good, but for 12 months is even better. It's hard for them to pay back the rent too. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Next Thank speaker, you. please. And next we'll go line of Scarlett De Leon, say the agenda item and if public comments. Hi, agenda item number 15, and then public comment. Um, Scarlett DeLeon, I'm with Act LA and Healthy LA. First, I want to thank Supervisor Ilda Solis for her leadership on this item. This item pursues local, state, and federal action, all of which are needed. We urge you to please pass all of the item number 15, which will help the board avoid the foreclosure disaster caused by the 2008 Great Recession, which led to a loss of homes across communities of color and low-wage earning communities, setting some families up for years of serious instability. Item 15 represents the kind of comprehensive relief for low-income homeowners, for small landlords, and for tenants that the county must pursue to avoid households of both Households of both renters and homeowners being displaced and even more people living in overcrowded conditions or even on the streets. Thanks. And for um, public comment, I just want to say that actually also supports item number three, four, six, seven, and 51B on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. And then next we'll go to Erin uh, Taxi. 
stay the agenda items and a pu public comment. Please go ahead. Add this supervisor Hall, can I uh, say I'd like something? To give, uh, general public comment as well as okay. address items mm -hmm. three mm -hmm. and six. Speaker, can you hold on? Speaker, can you hold on, please? Hold his time. Sure. Yeah, um, this is Supervisor Hahn. Somebody is not muted. I feel like it's in the county family because it is really uh, disruptive, and I'm having a hard time hearing the public comment. Supervisor Hahn, we're all muted here in the county. We have um, all our lines muted, so um, we'll look into it further. Yeah, I'm seeing one line that is not muted. And that's yours right now, Supervisor. And ours also. Speaker, go ahead, please. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Aaron Taxi with the Building Owners and Managers Association, Greater Los Angeles. Uh, on general public comment, we represent over 135 million square feet of commercial office space in LA County, and our members contribute an estimated $3.5 billion a year to California's economy. As we look to begin reopening our county, we are committed to reopening our office buildings in a safe and sanitary way, and we are also committed to working with tenants wherever possible to help them navigate these unprecedented times. This includes negotiating generous rent deferral plans, again, wherever possible, with businesses who have hit speed bumps during this emergency. That's also why we have provided numerous webinars and resources to our members on reopening and negotiating deferrals. We want to be part of the solution wherever possible. And on all of these issues, we are committed to working collaboratively with the board in the months ahead. Our working in good faith with all stakeholders, though, should not come disproportionately to cripple our own business. That leads me to agenda item three. We appreciate the intentions here, but we have had some members whose rental income has dropped 70 or more percent. We are ultimately concerned about this and ask for a delay in passing this agenda item uh, bef uh, before more, more thorough study is done. Uh, we are businesses, too, and this all impacts uh, our ability to pay our mortgages. Thank you. Your time is up. Next providers. speaker, please. Thank you. And thank you. Our next speaker will go directly to the line of Jared uh, Gonzalez. Say the agenda item and if public comments at this time. Hello, yes. I'd like to speak on agenda item three. Hello, honorable supervisors. I hope you and your loved ones are safe and healthy. Um, I represent Western Manufactured Housing Communities Association, a nonprofit trade association that represents mobile home park owners and operators through, throughout California. Uh, WMA um, currently opposes item three on the agenda. Um, there's no question that this pandemic has created instability for many. Park owners have answered the call to do the right thing during this crisis. Uh, they've worked directly with residents who are impacted by the coronavirus. They have demonstrated compassion. No one will be evicted from a WA member park during this pandemic. The emergency moratorium should not be automatically extended another three months to August 31. Rather, it should be reviewed perhaps on a month by month basis to ensure a more measured and thoughtful approach. This pandemic impacts everyone. As providers of an affordable housing solution, rent debt should not be made harder to obtain when this passes. And that's what will happen if rent becomes unsecured debt. We are all finding a way Thank to you. move Your forward. Your time is up. Thank next you. speaker, please. Thank you. And next we'll go to the line of Armando uh, Flores. Uh, say the agenda item and if public comments. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning, Armando Flores with the Valley Industry and Commerce Association, uh, speaking on 51G and 51H, as well as item three and six and item seven. Uh, for items 51G and 51H, we would urge you to remove the language on rebuttable presumption and also urge you to remove the language on punitive damages. Um, the rebuttable pre uh, presumption provision shifts the uh, burden to the employer. Now an employer would need to prove that they terminated a worker for disciplinary actions, uh, requiring them to go to court. And should the court determine that a worker was terminated for non-disciplinary actions, an employer would be responsible for paying uh, punitive damages and those audit those added costs at this time during a pandemic is just going to drive businesses into the ground. Um, and items on items three and six, we oppose extending the moratorium and also have concerns with implementing a private right of action, which is uh, again going to promote litigation and, and just make things more expensive for businesses. Um, and item number seven, uh, we are concerned 
uh, that was going to force banks to disclose their plans uh, and, you know, just create a public list to, change, to shame banks into forced compliance and constitute a major government overreach. Uh, so we appreciate your time. Uh, we, we just hope that, you know, during this time when, when businesses are struggling, that we just don't make things more difficult and we focus on recovery uh, for these businesses. Uh, thank you. And thank you. Next, we'll go to the line of our Sarah Wilfong. Please say the agenda item and if public comments. Please go ahead. Uh, item 51G through H. Uh, my name is Sarah Wilfong, and I'm calling on behalf of the Los Angeles County Business Federation, also known as BizFed. We are an alliance of over 190 business organizations to represent 400,000 employers with 3.5 million employees in Los Angeles County. We are calling because we remain opposed to the right of recall and worker retention ordinances. While the business community applauds supervisors' leadership during this time, we are afraid the attempted, attempted solution won't help the situation now or when the crisis is behind us. Businesses are struggling to survive and doing their best to adapt under unprecedented circumstances. When this crisis is over, it should be up to them how to figure out how best to rehire and rebuild their businesses. Both the LA Times and the Southern California News Group editorial boards released their opposition to the right of recall ordinance when it was originally proposed at the city of Los Angeles. To quote the LA Times, the government has an interest in employers getting back to business as quickly and as easily as possible. It's best to help them do it rather than impose burdensome rules and regulations for how to do it. Thank you for your consideration of our comments. And remember. And thank you. Next, uh, we'll go to the line of uh, Patricia. Uh, Bruna, say the agenda items and if public comments at this time. Yes, uh, these are agenda item 51G, 51B, and 51H. And public comments. Thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to address you. I, my name is Patricia Bruno, and I am representing the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce, which we represent over 1,400 um, businesses in the Los Angeles area. Um, this is already an incredibly difficult time for small and medium-sized business businesses that are desperately trying to keep their doors open. The businesses require maximum flexibility. We need to empower businesses to continue operations and employ Angelinos during this unprecedented crisis not additional regulations that will lead to business closures. The business community is committed um, to partnering with the Board of Supervisors to develop policies that will ensure our employees are protected and can come out of this crisis financially sound, but this must be a collaborative conversation. Um, in regards to the right of recall and worker retention ordinances, they could have really detrimental impact on the business community by establishing rebuttal presumption. If an employee is laid off, Employers will spend anywhere between 35000 to 50000 to defend themselves in court. Having punitive damages provisions is also very concerning. This will exponentially increase the risk of an employer by turning a small claim into a six-figure or seven-figure claim. There must be an also clear an exemption for collective bargaining agreements. Employers spend years finalizing their agreements with labor and their employees. The CBAs represent the priorities of the employees and labor. This ordinance uh, will undo and unravel these CBAs if they are not uh, clearly exempted and protected. Having to lay off employees is never an easy decision, but should that be, that should be at the discretion of the business who is desperately trying to remain open and survive the crisis. Um, the reality of the post-COVID-19 approaches of business is changing incredibly unclear. Um, adding hiring additional re regulations at this time when these businesses are looking to remain closed or operate in uncertain times will completely decimate their business model and lead to the loss of thousands more jobs in our region. Thank you. Uh, Your time like is up. Next speaker, please. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll go to the line of uh, Daniel Gaines, uh, city agenda item and if public comments. Hi there, can you hear me? We can hear you. Please go ahead. Say your agenda okay. items and if public yes. comment. I would, I would like to speak on um, item number four in general public comment. Um, my name is Daniel Gaines. I'm a, a case manager at Homeless Healthcare Los Angeles. I work with, um, you know, people experiencing homelessness. And I'm calling, I, I strongly support the Healthy LA platform. And um, interim housing is really the key here to saving our most vulnerable people experiencing homelessness while they wait for permanent housing. 
this really should have been happening from the get-go, but now we're doing it with uh, COVID with Project Room Key, which is good for um, you know those who qualify for it. But rough sleepers are 10 times more likely to die before COVID. Um, so we really need to ensure that everyone is off the streets while, we, while waiting for their permanent housing. Um, and so this recovery, you know, we're really going to need to include the voices of those who've lived with the experience, coalitions like Services Not Sweep, to implement an equitable recovery plan, and we need to use all the tools at our disposal to house them, including identifying vacant land and properties that can be repurposed, putting those with, fixed, with lived experience on the task force for recovery, and utilizing hotels that have space but choose not to participate in Project Room Key. Thank you. Uh, Your time is up. Next speaker, please. And thank you. And once again, to place your line into queue, you will need to press one, then zero. At that time, we'll ask you to state your agenda item and if public comment. We'll go directly to the line of Lyric uh, Kelkar. Please go ahead and at this time, say the agenda items and if public comment. Hi, I'd like to speak on items three, four, six, seven, fifteen, and 51B with emphasis on six and 15. So good morning, my name is Larry Kelker and I work in an organization called Inclusive Action for the City. We're a member organization of Healthy LA and support the whole Healthy LA platform. Uh, we're a commercial property landlord on the east side of Los Angeles. And as a landlord, we're doing what we can to help our tenants, including the deferral of rent payments, but not everyone's doing that. We need to be seeking cash assistance for tenants and general debt relief like canceling rent and mortgages. But in the meantime, we need to be protecting small businesses by having more time to pay back their rent. I sincerely appreciate the work of Supervisors Han and Ridley Thomas in putting forward commercial tenant protections that encourage you to go further. I want to illustrate some scenarios for consideration. If a commercial tenant is unable to pay rent for two months and then only have three months to pay back and are making equal back rent payments, they're looking at a 66% increase in monthly rent for three months. If this is extended to six months, it equates to a 33% increase, but allowing for 12 months of pay time would would lead to a 16% increase, which is still large and will deeply impact small businesses, but less burdensome than the 33% increase. All businesses should be given 12 months or longer to pay back rent, and especially those with less than 100 people. An extended period of payback time is crucial for keeping small businesses afloat at this very precarious time. Um, as a landlord, we wanna be helping and protecting these businesses that serve their neighborhoods, and an extended back pay time is the least we can do. Now I'd like to move to item 15. I deeply appreciate the work of Supervisor Solis to put forward a bold initiative to help families and households hardest hit by the pandemic. All of item 15 must be passed to ensure that communities most affected by the crisis come out on the other side without being saddled in debt. This item includes an important opportunity for tenants to purchase the property in which they live. This idea captured in section six is a key policy that will ensure that even in one of the most tumultuous economies ever experienced, Tenants have an opportunity to purchase their home and keep housing permanently affordable. This concept will not only support tenants themselves, but also encourage the preservation of communities who were pillaged by real estate speculators after the recession in 2008. Thank you. Your time Your is morning. up. Thank you. Thank you. Our time for public speak. Our time for public speakers has ended. I want to thank you all that called in to speak. If you were unable to provide your comments, you may still submit written comments as indicated on the agenda. We will continue to accept all written comments that come in during the meeting, which will become part of the record. Madam Executive Officer, please indicate the agenda items on which we will be voting. The following items are before you. 1D, 2D, 3D, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 10 through 14, 16 through 18, 21 through 36, 38 through 50, 51C, 51D, 51E, and 51F. With that, I'll take, take roll call. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Willie Thomas. Aye. Supervisor Willie Thomas, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Okay, uh, very good. We are going to, um, today, we will begin with items three, four, followed by item six, item 15, then item 51A related to items 51B, 51G, 
and 51H, as well as A1. So we will begin with item number three, which was held uh, by me, actually. Um, I don't know if uh, either Supervisor Solis or Supervisor Q will want to say anything, but I'll just make really quick remarks. I want to thank you both for your continued leadership on these critical uh, measures to protect county residents during this emergency. We all understand that this emergency is ever evolving and that as we continue under the current public health order, that staying at home is crucial as we flatten the curve and we've seen that firsthand. My office continues to receive dozens and dozens of calls and emails from residents that truly are struggling to pay their bills and put food on the table, as we heard from many of the public comments today. They are concerned they may not have jobs to return to. Businesses are questioning whether they will be able to rebound after the closures are lifted. The county has been working on implementation of a rental assistance program, and I support these type of solutions that help provide the needed relief for tenants. But I would also like to take note that I hope that these report backs also take into consideration the financial burdens placed on landlords as well. We should be thinking of comprehensive solutions that address the issues faced by individuals at every single level of the housing change. Uh, we need to have a clear and concise policy in place that will provide protections for our constituents in need, and we should continue to identify other steps that the county can take to provide additional support. And with that, I would ask a friendly amendment on this, um, and I understand that Supervisor Hahn also wants to do that with me, that the Board of Supervisors authorize the chair to execute an amended reinstated executive order that incorporates the following provision. Extend the moratorium until June 30th, 2020, and reevaluate every 30 days to provide further extensions. So with that, I would ask for that amendment to be considered. Supervisor Khan and then Supervisor Kuehl. Thank you. Uh, did you want to have the co-author speak before me, Madam Chair? Yes, go ahead, Supervisor Kuehl. I was doing it in list of uh, order of which I got, but Supervisor Kuehl? I thought you were doing it in alphabetical order. I was certainly going to be obedient. Uh, however, I would indicate, though you uh, in, you said you were proposing the amendment as a friendly amendment, and I accept that it's a friendly amendment, but cannot accept the amendment, and I'll tell you why. Um, this uh, eviction moratorium, which we, in our last meeting, extended to the entire county, is one of the major tools really in the county for keeping us healthy because those who can be evicted of course will be out on the street because the reason they're evicted is they couldn't pay their rent and they're out of work i've asked dr ferrer at uh, whenever you say it is correct hi madam chair to speak to why august 31st was a uh, a correct date for us to choose to extend the moratorium. Um, it's based on guidance from the Department of Public Health because we know that many, many Angelenos will really not be able to return to work. And without jobs, of course, the residents can't pay rent. We've heard over and over again, including today uh, in our uh, public testimony, it uh, seeks just to ensure a basic level of protections across the county. Some of the cities may already have a protection for commercial tenants, but not residential tenants. Some cities do the opposite. Uh, we want to make it as uniform as possible uh, and ask county council to report back on additional ideas to strengthen protections across the county. Um, I wanted to call everyone's attention to an article that was published in the New Yorker just today about why eviction protection is an important part of public health. Um, I'm sure you're aware of all of the many millions of people who have filed for unemployment insurance, uh, though it doesn't happen as quickly as it should when you file, uh, everybody is really hurting. I know that landlords are hurting as well. I know that we're going to ask the banks to defer uh, mortgage payment, but there are hundreds of thousands of tenants, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of tenants in the county, 
and we cannot really at this point afford to let them be evicted. So I understand the impulse for the uh, amendment, but I would ask my colleagues to resist this amendment. Um, and the uh, uh, necessity of keeping people in their living situation at least over the next three months is so critical. So uh, I would ask for your support for our three month extension. Um, it, you know, we're in dire times and I think this strikes a balance. Having to come back every month would create amazing anxiety in an already anxious group of people. Think about being a tenant and not knowing if the next month you'll be evicted and the next month you'll be evicted and the next month you'll be evicted. And that I think is the problem with taking this one month at a time and waiting to see if the Board of Supervisors will extend for 30 more days or 30 more days or 30 more days. Um, I really believe that this three months will go by as fast as the past three months have gone by and we need these protections. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Hahn. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you uh, both to my colleagues, uh, Supervisor Kuehl and Solis, for this motion in the beginning. And I mean, I agree with everything um, that you're saying, Supervisor Kuehl. Um, we know that there are, you know, millions of tenants who um, are part of this, uh, you know, are, are the victims of this global pandemic. We know that many of these working families um, who uh, we're already having a tough time paying their rent, um, are, are not going to be able to do it right now. So I totally support um, the eviction moratorium, and I support extending it. Um, and uh, we are looking at the other side of this equation on this very agenda, actually. We, we are looking to give some relief to our landlords. Uh, I've got a motion called Responsible Banking that looks at ways that we can you know, really encourage our banks to provide mortgage relief because there's two sides of the equation to every rental property. Certainly it's those who are living there on, and are required to pay their rent. And it's also uh, the other side of the equation is the landlords. And many of them have mortgages that they're trying to make on this property um, so that people can continue to live there. So, so it's a, sort of a, it's an equal equation that we have to look at both sides. Um, but these are this um, uh, eviction moratorium is a good policy. It will make sure that uh, we're not allowing people to be thrown out right now uh, and just adding to this uh, horrible situation. But I do uh, agree with Supervisor Barger that we should look at this on a month to month basis. Uh, our reopening, our recovery, it's really in flux. Um, and we will look at public health data, but we're also really going to be looking at, you know, the the economic data that we're seeing. And uh, we don't uh, really know how it's all going to play out. But I think um, this doesn't in no way take away the eviction moratorium, but it just says, let's take a good look at it uh, in June, in July, in August and see um, if we're making any progress. And I think that's good for us to do that exercise, frankly, um, while assuring our renters that they've got this protection. It also gives our landlords um, a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel as well. And I think that's really the balance and the compromise. And in fact, I think uh, by us doing this on a monthly basis, we may very well look at, you know, uh, in July, we may say, you know what, we're not ready to end it in August, we might need to extend it to September. So I think it's an important exercise that we do that we look at this month to month. And clearly, right now, we are, we came up to the to the edge by, uh, by extending it another three months. So I don't think it hurts this equation at all to do it month to month. I think that gives both sides um, sort of uh, a, a better roadmap as we go forward. So um, and the other thing I just wanted to add is I just want to make sure that our landlords and our tenants are aware of these new policies and that our 
Department of Community and Business Affairs is really launching a uh, an aggressive public awareness campaign on, on what we are doing here today. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Solis. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank Supervisor Kuehl for auth authoring the motion and I also uh, want to thank her for the ability over the previous years to work on similar motions in protection for our tenants and under the eviction moratorium. I'm pleased to be a co-author on this, this particular motion. No, we have a lot more work to do and obviously our tenants are suffering uh, extreme pain right now. Uh, I know that the loss of job and, and wages is just adding to more um, frustration and even in some cases uh, duress that I've never seen in my lifetime, even compared to 2008 and 2009. I know we have to do something quickly. I think this is a good approach to move in that direction. And I know that uh, there are other cities that may not have a strong uh, moratorium protections in place. So this will help to provide, I think, that uh, protection and leadership. So I want to say I, I thank you to DCBA for their work and Supervisor Kuehl for introducing the motion. Thank you. Okay, seeing uh, uh, Barbara Ferrer, would you like to speak? Sure. Um, yes. Uh, thank you. This is this is Barbara. Um, I, I, the director of uh, the Department of Public Health. I, I just wanted to um, note that you know, based on all of the data that uh, we're looking at, and and I agree 100 percent that this is a really good opportunity to continue to be driven by the data. Um, we we know with all certainty that we would be extending health officer orders you know, for, for the next three months. Um, you know, there's there's no way, you know, unless uh, there was uh, a, a dramatic change in sort of this virus uh, and the tools that we have at hand to, to actually uh, fight against this virus, there's no way that we could, in fact, see um, us not needing to continue with a set of restrictions. I mean, our hope always is that we're able by using the data to be able to lift restrictions uh, slowly over the next three months. Um, but I, I know that, you know, without good therapeutic medicines that are widely available and widely affected, without a vaccination, and without the kind of sort of home testing rapid test kits uh, that would let every single person test themselves every single day, you know, what's left are in fact the uh, restrictions on uh, on that are that form the biggest part of our community mitigation efforts and the contact tracing that we do to make sure that uh, we're able to isolate and quarantine people as appropriate. Um, so you know, I, I just wanted to make sure that um, I, as I've been working with everyone, that uh, from a public health perspective, uh, you know, it's an unfortunate uh, part of this pandemic is that it is so long lasting. Um, and we are working on creating dashboards so that we can really look with a lot of frequency at what are the measures that allow us to have confidence that all of the work we're doing together moves us forward in this recovery phase. But I do think recovery will be months long uh, based on the tools that we have at hand today. Thank you. Um, Supervisor Kuehl, you wanna make some comments in closing? Yes, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I think that it is very important to follow the guidelines of our public health department. Uh, they have indicated that there, as Dr. Ferrer just said, there is really no way this is gonna be over by the end of June. A lot of people will still not be back to work, not be allowed to go back to work, be encouraged not to go back to work. It is still at the height of the pandemic for us. I believe that if you uh, will insist on this amendment, uh, that I hope that my colleagues most respectfully, Madam Chair, will vote down the amendment because the anxiety produces, produced by going month to month, not only for the tenants who are already at the height of anxiety about being out of work, about schooling their children at home, about trying to keep healthy, um, but also for landlords, many of whom spoke to me personally about how 
they don't like three month extension, but they like the certainty of it. They don't like to have to worry every month. Is this going on or not going on? Also, I'm not really certain how it helps us to um, evict people. You give someone a notice, you're trying to get them out. Uh, there's a lot of, of upset, uh, upsetness in the family. And um, still, it would be August 31st. I mean, it's much better to be certain. So I would ask you to reconsider the amendment and be with us on extending this just three months. The apartment owners need the certainty. The, the tenants need the certainty. Uh, the health directives really indicate that this is the best way to go. And I ask for a vote of no on the amendment and an I vote on the original uh, proposal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. With that, Madam Executive Officer, will you please read the names of those that have submitted on this item? The following individuals submitted comments in favor. Ron Recht, Alicia Hancock, Robin, Ashley Thomas, Keisha Wade, Hannah Hickson, Ada Ramirez, Erica Briss, Charles Koo, Natalie Burke, Christy Lease, Christopher Wong, Bryn Rasmussen, Colleen Evanson, Alicia Ness, and Angel M. Castillo. Alexander Fierro Clark, Joseph O'Conn, John Kern, Mickey Jackson, David Levitis, Nancy Liza, Judith Eva Charney, Fanny Ortiz, Rebea Sin, Esme Germain, Amy Wong, Natoli Lauren, Hannah Murphy, Alexis Nunes, Celia Nava, Greg Spiegel, Diane Prado, Heron, Harris Kornstein, Samantha Honowitz, Diane Valencia, Matt Waite, Aaron L. Temin, Elsa Tung, Joe Donlin, Pilar Schiavo, Stephanie Carroll, Stephanie Hirsch, Michelle Hill, Jesho Yang, Jasmine Johnson, Henry Perez, Jennifer Maldonado, Sergio Vargas, Laura Raymond, Alana Holt, Janice Yu, Liridona Letty, Stanislav Schechtman, Zakaria Flores, Mayoria Rita Perry, Christian Cardenas, Laura Raymond, Jeremy Pennock. The following submitted under a post, Cindy McCaughey, Larry Rubenstein, Alfred Somek, Rita Oss, George Matsura, Mastis Kodaverdian, Rebecca Levitsky, Stanislav Sedov, David Kornbluth, David Flores, Bruce Rupo, Lanet Lanet, Susan Blaise, Brett Johnson, Craig Rooney, Hosek Njarian, Daniel Poyor, Lisa Halebian, Salim, James Hyatt, Lizio Estrada, Natalia Adomian, Sharona Sainoff, Nelson Matheson, Carol Francis Swayze, Danielle Liener Peretz, Tammy Warner, Fred Sutton, Laura Ohasso, David Lanzer, David Bergman, Mark Berger, Levon Yankibarian, John Ruffner, Anoush Zakarian, Gavorg Voskonian, and the following submitted under other Andrea Stint, Horace H. Height, Jay Jordan, Howard, Howard Steenwick, Susan Anderson, Jim Berryman, Natalia Vekic, Sandy Sanchez, David Fleming, Tracy Hernandez, and Natalia. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Executive Officer, will you please uh, read what we're going to be voting on? So the first item on item three is the item amended by Supervisor Barger and Supervisor Hahn uh, to extend the moratorium until June 30th, 2020 and reevaluate every 30 days. Um, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Riley Thomas. No. Supervisor Riley Thomas, no. Supervisor Kill. No. Supervisor Kill, no. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Motion carries three to, to two. On the original motion as um, on item three on the remaining motions, um, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Riley Thomas. Aye. Supervisor Riley Thomas, aye. Supervisor Kill. Aye. Supervisor Kill, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Now we will move on to item number four, which was held by Supervisor Kuhl. Supervisor Kuhl. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to call up uh, all of these comments in my phone. Um, the uh, 
COVID-19 crisis has collided head on with our ongoing homeless crisis. And it actually threatens to reverse the really notable progress we've made since adoption of the homeless initiative. We know that people experiencing homelessness are at extraordinarily high risk from COVID-19 and that the virus is much more dangerous to them because of underlying health conditions exacerbated by homelessness. We've also seen the statistics about the disparity based on race, based on poverty, and we can see so many communities hard hit by this. The state responded very quickly and created Project Room Key. And California was the first state in the country approved for FEMA reimbursement to bring people experiencing homelessness who were 65 years or older or with an underlying health condition inside during this pandemic. This county acted quickly with commitment and inventiveness. Local cities joined us by identifying Project Room Key sites and expanding their hygiene stations. The city of LA alone really stepped up and has helped over a thousand people get off the streets, been a great partner in helping people get medical care, as well as testing out to people still on the streets. The result, we've done two years of work in just two months. It shows that we can do it. And it's a huge accomplishment. Nearly 5,000 of our elderly, frail, and sickest homeless neighbors have the safety of a roof over their heads today. Now we need to continue to act with that same kind of commitment and that same kind of inventiveness. Because as we begin to contain this crisis, if those 5,000 elderly and ill men and women are just released right back out onto the streets, many of them will undoubtedly die. We must ensure that those who today have temporary housing, because we were determined to make it happen, have a path to permanent housing. That's why I'm asking LASA to lead our efforts to develop a homeless COVID-19 recovery plan to go with all the other great recovery plans that we're trying to work on. And I want to see a bold plan that does two things, to provide continued housing opportunities for everyone we've temporarily sheltered in response to the crisis and ensure that thousands of new people don't fall into homelessness because of the COVID-19 economic crisis. You know, I'm sure there are skeptics listening who think it can't be done, but they're the same people who wouldn't have believed we could house 5,000 people in six weeks. We can do it. And we have assets to look to in order to start. Coronavirus relief funds, Measure H housing resources, philanthropic partners lining up to help. If we draft a bold plan and commit to it, I believe that the state and the federal government will join us as well. Colleagues, this crisis is the greatest challenge many of us will face in our careers. I'm asking you all to be bold. I'm deeply grateful to my co-author, Supervisor Mark Ridley Thomas, and I hope you will support uh, this effort. And Madam Chair, when it's appropriate, I'd like to ask Heidi Marston, our uh, Interim Executive Director at LASA, to be allowed to speak to this as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Supervisor Ridley Thomas, do you want to say anything? Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you for your leadership, uh, Supervisor Kuhl. Uh, today's motion, I believe, uh, complements the motion that Supervisor Hahn and I put forward on April 14th uh, to advance a local comprehensive crisis response to address homelessness. Uh, that motion, as you'll recall, directed staff to develop uh, post-pandemic housing plans for those aged uh, 65 and older. Now today, uh, Madam Chair and colleagues, uh, this motion seeks to expand the post-pandemic objectives to all those housed through Project Room Key, uh, including those uh, younger than 65 years and um, who have chronic health conditions. And I believe this is wholly appropriate. La <clears throat> Pardon me, Lassa tells us on average, the people who have been brought inside as a protective measure are aged 54 years. Now, that's contrary to the initial uh, reporting and concern and focus of, of those that were 65 and above, but uh, take note. 
54 years is the average. I think this is in line with what we've learned from our public health department, which um, is validating national studies and showed that the health conditions of unsheltered homeless individuals resemble persons who are at least 15 to 20 years older. That's how harsh homelessness is. And in the midst of this global pandemic, I'm sure we all understand and agree that the county has activated an unprecedented public-private uh, partnership with cities, with private hotel owners, with public sector, healthcare staff, a shout out to our workforce and to uh, disaster service or worker volunteers, uh, an unprecedented level of volunteerism displaying itself in that form and civic engagement. Look at the community-based uh, nonprofit service providers. Uh, they're showing up and they're showing out and it's a good thing. And uh, now uh, we're currently uh, housing almost 1,800 vulnerable residents in 23 hotel sites across the region. And I think that's a, a remarkable achievement and we are not yet done. And so Madam Chair and members, this crisis within a crisis prompted bold action to protect vulnerable elderly residents, preserve the public health and provide income to hotel owners. Uh, we call it a win-win. Uh, sustaining these services will require political will and sustained revenue from local, state, and federal sources. So there can be no truer test of our values than this collective effort to bring our most vulnerable inside. Stay resolute in our determination to connect them to long-term stable housing. Seems to me as a worthy goal, a worthy pursuit. And Madam uh, Chair and colleagues, I commit myself to join in that effort with you as we push toward a higher quality of life for those who are yet homeless. Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Solis. Thank you, Madam Chair. I also want to uh, commend Supervisor Kuehl and Ridley Thomas for bringing this motion forward. Also want to take a moment to thank our county departments and also want to thank LASA, our CEO Homeless Initiative, DMH, DHS, Office of Diversion and Reentry, DPH, and the Sheriff's host teams and LA County Fire for the many uh, support services that they provided to the individuals that are currently housed under this program. It, it is without a doubt one of the most important items I think on our agenda today. And I really want to uh, give a shout out to Governor uh, Newsom uh, for his efforts in creating Project Room Key. Um, it's been great working with his staff and with some of our cities and also with the private motel and hotel owners in our district. And I wanna say that while this is a tough situation for us, sometimes a crisis presents opportunity and that's what I see in this program. And I do believe we have an obligation to help provide assistance to people over 65 years of age and older and people who have underlying medical conditions. That's what this is about, the prevention of more COVID-19 spread, but also making sure that we're taking care of those homeless individuals. And that number, I believe uh, the count, uh, we're awaiting the 2020 homeless count now. And I know that the last count of 2019 was was 44,000 individuals experiencing homelessness in LA County at, at any given time. 8,800 are family members, 3,900 are veterans, 8,900 are youth younger than the age of 24, and more than 5,200 seniors are age 62 and over, and over 18,000 happen to be women. Uh, at the same time that we're trying to develop affordable housing and housing solutions, we know that it takes a lot of time. It doesn't mean that we're gonna give up and not focus on that, but right now is a time to move expeditiously. So we know we can help our cities through also providing this type of support and thank goodness for FEMA and the governor for helping to provide through FEMA 75% of that funding. And then obviously the state and the county are picking up the remainder. This is one of the best projects that I've seen undertaken. It is hard though. I would ask that we as a board also agree that we have to coordinate with the city of Los Angeles on a homeless COVID-19 recovery plan, 
but also include all the other 87 cities and especially those that are cooperating with the state and the county right now. And a few of them are just to name are El Monte, Monterey Park and Pomona. And I wanna thank them for stepping up to this challenge. So I strongly uh, support this motion and hope that we will further our outreach to include the other cities and move them along as well. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Solis. Supervisor Hahn. Madam Chair, thanks, uh, uh, Supervisor Ridley Thomas, Supervisor Kuehl for <clears throat> introducing this motion. <clears throat> Hold on. Um, uh, and as uh, Supervisor Ridley Thomas said, this is great because it really builds on the motion that uh, you and I did, Supervisor Ridley Thomas, uh, a few weeks ago uh, when we began to look into uh, housing options for our homeless senior citizens, many of whom are in our care due to Project Room Key. Um, and uh, the stats that say we've taken over 1,500 people off the streets and into a room are really encouraging. And as you all know, many of these are our senior citizens. They're 65 and older. And if they got it infected, uh, they would definitely probably go to the hospital and um, they could very well lose their life. And I just wanna say, I'm proud of our county staff, lots of our homeless providers that have really been instrumental in setting up Project Room Key. It was a great vision of our governor to come up with this idea, but it has really fallen on our county to do the real heavy lifting in terms of negotiating uh, the rooms and really working and lots of working to identify the folks to get uh, them into a room. And I will tell you, it's one of the fastest moving programs I think I've ever experienced since I've been working for the county. It's gone really warp speed, uh, so fast that some uh, our, our big uh, pushback sometimes has been some of our local communities and cities that uh, didn't really know it was happening because it happened so fast. But I'm in favor of how fast we've been doing it because um, I, I think it makes complete sense, as Supervisor Ridley Thomas said, to help these struggling hotel motel owners, who also, by the way, are the ones that would be employing janitorial staff, housekeepers, uh, keeping people employed. Uh, but it has an end date. It's, it's technically for three months. So <clears throat> this uh, motion really uh, is a big, another big heavy lift to figure out what we're going to do at the end of those three months to make sure uh, that these folks have interim housing, permanent housing, um, and anything else to make sure that they don't end up back on the street. Nobody wants that. Uh, I do like it that this motion directs our legislative affairs uh, department to really uh, plead for help from Sacramento and DC. Uh, we need more resources as we undertake this. This is a huge undertaking. It's gonna take a lot of resources but thanks you for bringing this up. A lot of work, and we're uh, I'm so help so grateful and help and and uh, ready to help in any way I can. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, and I, I also would like to thank Supervisor Kuehl and Ridley Thomas for bringing this motion forward. Uh, Pre COVID nineteen, uh, the county has been involved in the lawsuit, and post COVID COVID nineteen, I've gotten to know Judge Carter, who has been very instrumental in ensuring that um, the issue as it relates to those that are most vulnerable right now on the streets are getting shelter. And there's no question that we all recognize that this is um, a challenge, but given how quickly we've been able to get the motels, I I'm proud of Santa Clarita, Palmdale, Lancaster in my district that have stood tall and um, we've been able to house those people. It shows me that we can move mountains when we have to. And as we look towards recovery across a variety of sectors, it's critical that we act with intention to identify structures and resources for those that are experiencing homelessness and those at risk of experiencing homelessness and in this new reality. There are three primary concerns here. How do we keep the people we've gotten into housing through the efforts like Project Room Key in some form of housing. So once Project Room Key disappears, we need to ensure that we have a continuity ensuring they're staying housed. How do we support our homeless services system 
which has worked so hard to mount this emergency response effort to add even more capacity to keep our momentum strong. And last, how do we prevent a new inflow of homelessness given the economic challenges that we are now facing moving forward? I'm proud of the efforts of this board to move toward safely and steadily reopening parts of our economy. And I understand how critical this movement is for all residents in Los Angeles County, but especially the small business owners, mom and pop landlords, the individuals and families who are just one paycheck away from falling into homelessness. In addition to supporting these residents, we must all make sure to support our most vulnerable and who remain in temporary housing or are still on the streets. I'm proud to support this motion, which will capitalize on the unprecedented efforts we're already, we've already made to temporarily house our most vulnerable and, and I emphasize, and ensure long-term stability for our homeless service system. I do want to make sure that the group of key stakeholders that will be convened to develop the COVID-19 recovery plan includes a focus on all of our cities. Engaging with the California Contract Cities Association and the League of Cities would be critical to establishing a plan for recovery and long-term resilience for all residents experiencing homelessness. I want to note that we've done something incredible here. We've housed more people more quickly than we ever have before. We cannot let those people fall back into homelessness and we cannot lose this momentum that we've built. I do have one question though regarding our advocacy efforts. And Sachi, how do we ensure that the third directive here allows us to work in alignment with other advocacy efforts that the county will make to rebuild the region, especially with the federal government? So thank you, Supervisor um, Barger. And um, yes, in terms of trying to look forward, I think as everybody knows, we are on an economic downturn. However, um, a bit of good news as we were sitting here, we just received the, um, the uh, CARES Act 4 language that will be taken up by the House on Friday. And it appears that um, there is additional funding for the counties as well as the cities. And I am hopeful as we move forward that um, if this should pass and we are able to get additional uh, assistance from the federal government that we would um, also be mindful in trying to um, look towards uh, backfilling some of our revenue loss, which includes um, the Measure H loss and would be helpful as we try and work on the transition for Project Room Key. Okay, very good. So um, I firmly believe that we need explicit mention of support for those experiencing or on the brink of homelessness. And so I want to make sure that we're coordinating those efforts. And I would ask that um, once you flush out that language that, um, and I don't know if County Council can weigh on this, that we do an urgency motion to send a five SIG supporting language that, that does that or whatever is needed to make sure that we are strongly advocating uh, forward getting that passed. Absolutely. Um, and County Council is here right now. And so they're taking note of that. Um, I think we are pouring through the language. There's quite a few line items that's included in the bill language, but um, we will work with all of your offices. Very good. Thank you. And now Heidi, would you like to say something? Lawson? Hi, thank you. Yeah, good morning. Thank you for having me. Um, it's no question that homelessness was a crisis prior to COVID-19 19 and the pandemic has further compounded that issue. Uh, our system has worked around the clock, as you all have mentioned, to build this capacity to ensure that our unsheltered neighbors have access to hygiene, food, testing. Um, we've extended the winter shelter program and sustained our capacity and at the same time have set up over a thousand new shelter beds as well as 2,300 hotel rooms across 24 sites and 100 trailers that are now open across the county. We've made tremendous progress rapidly getting people inside. And I think if there's one thing that we all agree on, it's that we cannot go back to the status quo. Uh, we know the public health and economic crises created by COVID-19 disproportionately impact people experiencing homelessness, as well as communities of color and people with disabilities and underlying health conditions our homeless system has significant resource constraints and we had that prior to COVID-19 
Um, we know this crisis will be long lasting and we know that the, long, the longer the crisis lasts, the harder it will be for people experiencing homelessness um, and those with low income or extremely low income to meet their basic needs. To ensure that our homeless response system is positioned to save as many lives as possible and is poised to address long-term impacts of COVID-19, we need to establish a response framework that drives progress and that prepares us for future emergencies and crises as well. The National Alliance and Homelessness put forward five key focal points for communities to consider when developing the COVID-19 recovery plan um, in the short term, the midterm, and the long term. Those focal points are prevention and diversion, unsheltered homelessness, shelter, housing, and strengthening systems for the future. LASA, in collaboration with our city and county partners, will develop the framework response within the context of these five strategies and harness the momentum that we've already built to drive results that will give our most vulnerable neighbors a place that they can call home. Uh, thank you for letting me speak and we're eager to get to work on this. Thank you. Um, Mary Whitcomb, did you wanna say something? Thank you, Supervisor, just to clarify, if you are asking, uh, that if you're presenting to the board the request for a five signature letter to support uh, what's going on in, in Washington DC right Act now with the CARES Act 4, they want to move that and we need a second. Supervisor Solis seconded. Second, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, thank you. We'll get, get that together. All right. Seeing no request for anyone else to speak, Madam Executive Officer, would you read off the names of those that have signed up on this item? The following individuals submitted comments in favor. Keisha Wade, Ashley Thomas, Robin, Juan Garza, Sandra Armenta, Anna Hickson, Erica Briss, Amy Tenenbaum, Bryn Rasmussen, John Kern, Alexander Fierro Clark, Angel Castillo, Andy Seymour, Allison Henry, Esme Germain, Amy Wong, Lauren Notoli, Hannah Murphy, Celia Nava, Alexis Nunes, Greg Spiegel, Don Sider, Diane Prado, Sonja Vern, Ron Collins, Lex Roman, Jill Shook, Allison Hurst, Samantha Honowitz, Jeff Katz, Pilar Schiavo, Jesho Yang, Janice Yu, Aaron L. Temin, Natalia Vekic, Sergio Vargas, Laura Raymond, Ron Collins, Elana Holt, Shai Dimas, Waldo Gonzalez, Liridona Letty, Stanislav Shekman, Maya Rita Perry, Laura Raymond, Hassan Zuniga, the following submitted under Oppose, Susan Blaise, and the following submitted under Other, Matt Waite and Erica Hudson. That's all, Madam Chair. Thank you. Item four, as amended, is before us. Madam Executive Officer, would you take the roll? Item four as amended. Supervisor Solis? Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Willie really Thomas? Aye. Supervisor Willie really Thomas, aye. Supervisor Kuehl? Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn? Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger? Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Now we move on to item number six, tenant protections during the COVID-19 crisis. It was held by Supervisor Hahn. Please unmute your mic and make remarks. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Supervisor Willie Thomas, for co-authoring this. Okay, so this motion does uh, a couple of things to improve our eviction moratorium, I think. The first one is that it instructs our Department of Consumer and Business Affairs to provide a list of documents that businesses can use to show that they've been impacted by COVID-19 and therefore can't pay their rent. Uh, these documents uh, might include gross receipts or bank statements before and during COVID-19. The second thing um, this motion does is that it will exclude businesses that are multinational, publicly traded, or have more than 100 employees. Um, this will ensure that these emergency tenant protect protections are not exploited by uh, big businesses who can't afford to pay their rent. Um, we know, as we've talked earlier in this meeting, that the eviction moratorium is meant to keep families in their home, keep small businesses afloat during the crisis, and it isn't meant to benefit big businesses who don't really need the help. So I think these are common sense updates to our eviction moratorium and that they'll ensure that the benefits are reserved for the tenants that really need them. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Supervisor Ridley Thomas, would you like to say anything? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 
I'd like to acknowledge the uh, tremendous team at the Department of Consumer and Business Affairs and uh, County Council who have been working on our efforts to support uh, both renters and property owners. Um, Supervisor Hahn, your leadership and attentiveness on this subject is well documented and I uh, acknowledge that and thank you for uh, the partnership here. The economic impacts of this crisis threaten to be just as profound as the public health impacts. So I think it's reasonable to say that during these unprecedented times, we must do our part to support uh, the small businesses that are the backbone of our economy, especially those that have been significantly impacted with the loss of income or impacted in terms of personnel due to uh, COVID-19. Uh, and these stories are all too frequent and equally heart-wrenching. The median annual revenue for LA County businesses with up to 100 employees is approximately $109,000. That's not a lot of change to spare. By some standards and by other standards, it could very well be argued that it is. But let me just be as clear as I can. Uh, this can easily be a zero-sum game with neither renters or mortgage holders having the resources needed uh, to prevent foreclosure in the months to come. So the banking industry needs to operate with immediacy and resourcefulness so that we um, uh, as a community, uh, together, in other words, can weather uh, this very, 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 very trying storm. I want to thank the board uh, for their consideration of this motion. I wish to say that I believe we will uh, provide needed clarity in this motion and ease of implementation uh, of the executive order. Madam Chair. Thank you. I also want to thank Supervisor Hahn and, and really Thomas for your efforts to ensure that the county is proactively working on solutions for those most impacted during this crisis. Our small businesses, which make up the heart of Los Angeles County's incredible economic engine, are hurting right now, and many are facing a reality of having to close their doors permanently. A recent survey published by Main Street America, a network of more than 1,600 commercial districts comprising 300,000 small businesses, showed that almost two-thirds of the entrepreneurs said they may have to shut forever if business disruption continues at the current rate for up to five months. More than 30% are at risk if the status quo persists for two months, according to the survey, which polled in excess of 5,800 small business owners. At a time when resources are limited, it's imperative that we focus our efforts to help the most vulnerable populations and those most in need of our support. I really do believe that we have an opportunity here to provide hope to many right now that are feeling hopeless. And I believe this motion will provide some sort of support for individuals that are not sure uh, if they're going to be able to survive. So I, I appreciate this motion and I believe uh, the timing is right and we need to let people know that we are all in this together. So with that, Supervisor Solis, do you have any comments? Madam Chair, not at this time. Thank you. Okay, seeing no one else has signed up to speak. Madam Executive Officer, can you read off the names of those that have submitted written testimony? individuals submitted comments in favor Alicia Hancock Robin Ashley Thomas Ada Ramirez Erica Briss Charles Sue Natalie Burke Christy Lease Colleen Evanson Joseph Ochkan Brian Rasmussen Jay Jordan John Kern Alexander Fierro Clark Alicia Ness Angel M Castillo Fanny Ortiz Andy Seymour Judith Eva Charney David Levitas Mickey Jackson Nancy Liza, Esme Germain, Amy Wong, Lauren Natoli, Hannah Murphy, Alexis Nunes, Celia Nava, Greg Spiegel, Diane Prado, Harris Kornstein, Sanantha Hanowitz, 
Diane Valencia, Matt Waite, Elsa May Tung, Joe Donlin, Pilver Schiavo, Jisho Yang, David Lanzer, Jennifer Maldonado, Laura Raymond, Alana Holt, Janice Yu, Stanislav Sheckman, Zakaria Flores, Maya Reed Perry, Christian Cardenas, Laura Raymond, Jeremy Pennick, Carmina Calderon, Estefany Solano, Hassan Zuniga, Lupe, Lupe Sanchez, and the following under opposed, Cindy McCaughey, and the, the following under other, Andrea Stint and Natalia Vekic. That is all, Madam Chair. Thank you. So we have this item before us. Madam Executive Officer, would you please take? Item six is before us. Supervisor Solis? Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Billy Thomas? Aye. Supervisor Billy Thomas, aye. Supervisor Kuehl? Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn? Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger? Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Very good. Now we move on to item number 15, emergency rental and mortgage relief, which was held by Supervisor Kuehl. Are you calling on me, Madam Chair? Yes, yes, Supervisor Q. I'm sorry. Yes, you held it. Thank you so much. I didn't know whether you wanted Supervisor Solis to present it first, which I would be happy to defer uh, for whatever you think is best. Uh, Supervisor Solis, I'll leave that. I mean, if... I think Supervisor Q should present her amendments and then I'll speak. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm not presenting amendments. Um, I'm asking. Uh, to be recorded uh, in terms of a, a certain kind of vote. Um, there's a lot in this motion, and a lot of it is uh, very good. But there are two sections that gave me some heartburn. Uh, I simply wanted to indicate that I wanted to ask the motion to be bifurcated when we vote. Uh, Directive 1, though it's been amended, still does include the concept of a rent forgiveness program. And I know there's been a lot of talk today. Everybody knows I'm pretty supportive of tenants, but I, I don't feel comfortable asking the um, state or federal government to um, forgive rent by our tenants, which means they would not have to pay it. I know that there are some programs proposed where uh, the state may be picking up rent for a while and then letting tenants pay them back. But until such a thing is in place, uh, I don't know that that's what this means. So I would ask, uh, I'm, I'm asked to have it bifurcated and cannot support uh, the first directive. The only other directive I had any uh, issue with was directive four, which had to do with, though it's a report back, I wanted to indicate my deep concern with the concept of deferring the collection of property taxes. Uh, again, I understand why people are saying, oh my God, I'm not working. How am I going to pay my property taxes? Though the final deadline for the next payment is December 10. I think that it is frankly irresponsible to defer the collection of property taxes when the county is called upon uh, to be supporting so much more these days than we've ever done. Our work is central and critical to recovery from this and response to this pandemic. And it is the collection of property tax on a timely basis that allows us to have the kind of cash flow that allows our um, workers to keep being in the field, to keep providing the uh, help and assistance that they do and I just don't think it's a good idea, even though it's a report back and I would expect the treasurer would say the same thing. I simply want to say that I can't support it and wonder if uh, Directive 4 could be bifurcated itself so that I might vote against asking for the deferral of property tax, but at the same time support ending PACE loans, which I think is a really good idea. So thank you, Madam Chair. Those are my two concerns. Thank you. And I know Supervisor Solis is going to speak, but I just wanted to offer an amendment to item number one. Uh, instead of, I, I would ask that the language change from mortgage forgiveness to mortgage relief. 
programs for residents impacted by COVID-19 to ensure that we are leveraging all available state and federal resources to support property owners and renters through the end of the safer at home orders. And I would ask that that be just on that one directive, uh, I would ask for that amendment to be considered. Supervisor Solis. Uh, Madam Chair, before you go on, if you're going to offer that amendment, would you object to the word relief for rent as well? Relief? Yeah, because it's a- it's Oh, I'm sorry, it, no, it, it's, I'm, I didn't read, it's rent and mortgage relief. Yes, absolutely, it's, it, that's included, rent and mortgage relief. And I believe um, I've got the executive officer has it and she'll read it um, in its entirety, but it, it does include that supervisor too. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Yes. Supervisor right. Solis. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And I'm, I'm fine with that uh, amendment. So uh, if you need a second on it, I'm happy to, to second that. I know it's a friendly thank amendment. You. I appreciate that. Um, if I might, um, thank you members and, and the public. Uh, you know, we've received communications from, I believe this morning, as well as correspondence that was sent to our offices from the Healthy LA Coalition, which as you know, makes up about 300 community advocates in support of all the motion directives included uh, in item 15. But as we've heard uh, during public comments, our advocates and even some homeowners support looking into the PACE programs. And this isn't the first time. I recall even as far as five years back when uh, Supervisor Antonovich was bringing some of these concerns to us. And now we know we've heard consecutively from many of our residents that are that have participated in the program. I know we've had a number of individuals from my district in Pomona and East LA and in the unincorporated areas that have had grave concerns with some of the program, this program in particular. But I know that uh, at this time, we also heard from witnesses that spoke to us that said that this is somewhat unbearable for some of their uh, elderly parents to be able to uh, maintain and many of their siblings who provide them with that support are now unemployed. So um, that, is, that is my intent, to look at how we can better provide supportive relief for these uh, individuals, these, these homeowners, in fact, that have done nothing, I believe, uh, through no fault of their own and are now in this predicament. So I do believe that the approaches uh, that are presented here in the strategies uh, can be very effective in helping the, the county move towards providing the kind of uh, support proposals, comprehensive uh, rent and mortgage relief. Uh, and I'm open to that amendment as was, as was presented by the chair. And directive four, if I might, just ask for a report back for a deferral of real property taxes and pace tax assessment. So it's not as though we're moving on it, we're asking for a report. and. I can't remember how far back in history when someone asked for a report that it's somehow not voted upon. So I was really taken aback when I had heard that from my staff and wasn't clear why. Um, but I know that things happen, but I am uh, open to working with everybody because I think this is a really important uh, effort on our part. And I know that um, this isn't the first time that we're going through uh, this economic downturn. It just happened 13 years ago, not to not too far off and now we're in a predicament where we need to provide federal rent and mortgage relief to our residents and we need to quickly move that along. So I am open to, to doing all that we can to make sure that we reach out to our entire uh, county, making sure that we provide support for proposals that are coming even out of Sacramento as we speak today. I believe that the Senate uh, Senator Atkins and some of her colleagues are going to be putting forth an effort to create a $25 billion economic recovery fund by issuing long-term vouchers to those willing to prepay their future state income taxes. So you can see, and providing rent relief. So people are moving in this direction, and I think it's incumbent upon the County Board of Supervisors to do the same. Um, I would say that uh, the approaches that we're undertaking here um, are, are, are many, and we're gonna need to be able to do more to also create social media awareness and also to prevent any further fraud and predatory practices. Those are essential for vulnerable populations. And moreover, the motion here explores creating a referral network of service providers that will help inform consumers about estate planning with the goal of preserving neighborhood properties. And we understand that even with these efforts, 
there'll be property owners who will default or otherwise transition ownership as a result of COVID-19 uh, to other entities. What we wanna make sure is that we put in place policies so that homes are not bought by speculators and who will worsen and uh, create a market that will be unbearable for many of our residents. Therefore, as you know, my motion will explore creating an opportunity for residential property owners before a notice of default on the property is issued to be able to sell their property to either an existing tenant, a community land trust, or a nonprofit or community mission driven entity, all with the goal, as you know, to preserve these properties for conservation to permanent affordable housing. So I look forward to creating a first right to purchase policy to prevent large scale corporate purchases of these properties, some of which I know my colleagues have advocated in the past, particular Supervisor Kuehl for being outspoken on this issue. Uh, thank you for always doing that and reminding us how important it is to keep our housing stock available to our residents. And then lastly, I wanna thank the governor uh, for his recent announcement that will make available 125 million in state disaster relief funds to help our undocumented individuals and families who have been excluded from the federal stimulus and benefit programs. And that's not to say that they haven't paid taxes. They pay sales tax, many of them pay property tax, and many of them do pay uh, federal income tax. Uh, and we should be taking account for that. So with that, Madam Chair, I would ask that uh, you consider supporting this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have anyone else that would like to speak on this item? Members of the public that have signed up to speak on this, please read the names. The following individuals submitted comments in favor. Alicia Hancock, Robin, Ashley Thomas, Keisha Wade, Ada Ramirez, Erica Briss, Charles Sue, Natalie Burke, Christy Lee, Colleen Evanson, Joseph O'Conn, Brian Rasmussen, John Kern, Alexander Fierro Clark, Alicia Ness, Angel M. Castillo, Christopher Wong, Fanny Ortiz, Judith Eva Charney, David Levitas, Alexandra Su, Mickey Jackson, Nancy Liza, Rebea Sen, Esme Germain, Gweek Kim, Amy Wong, Edgar Campos, Lauren Atoli, Hannah Murphy, Alex Nunes, Celia Nava, Greg Spiegel, Mariana Magana, Diane Prado, Harris Kornstein, David Ricardo Abud, Anna Marie Cuffgiano, June Shin, Samantha Honowitz, Diane Valencia, Matt Waite, Rudy Espinoza, Joe Donnelly, Tanya Love, Pilar Schiavo, Stephanie Carroll, Jisho Yang, Daniel Rodriguez, Jennifer Maldonado, Laura Raymond, Rudy Espinoza, Fanny Ortiz, Alana Holt, Janice Yu, Nisha Kashep, the Redona Letty, Stanislav Shekman, Zakaria Flores, Elsa Sanchez, Joseph Villala, Sparky Abraham, Christian Cardenas, Laura Raymond, Jeremy Pennock, Carmina Calderon, and Stephanie Solano, Hassan Zuniga, Lupe Sanchez, the following submitted under a post, Larry Rubenstein, Alfred Somek, Rita Oss, George Matsura, Mesis Cotaverdian, Stanislav Sedov, David Kornbluff, David Flores, Bruce Rupo, Lanet Lanet, Susan Blaise, Brett Johnson, Craig Rooney, Husik Najarian, Daniel Poirot, Justin Gold, John Vincenti, Lin Lisa Halevian, James Hyatt, Sharona Sainoff, Natalie Adomian, Liziel Estrada, Salim, Nelson Matheson, Carol Francis Swayze, Tammy Warner, Laura Olhaso, David Burnaman, Mark Berger, Levon Yangibarian, John Ruffner, Anoush Sakarian, Lanet Janet, Gavorg Voskanian, and those submitted under other, Horace H. Height, Jay Jordan, Howard Steenwick, Jim Berryman, Lori Gay, Natalia Vekic, and Jonathan Jager. Thank you. Supervisor Kuehl, you asked to speak again? Supervisor Kuehl. I had to re-open um, my phone. Um, I wondered, uh, I believe you said, Madam Chair, that we were going to hear the language of the amendment to number one, and then I'd like to speak again about number four. Okay, uh, I submitted the language, and the language that I asked for the amendment would read um, that uh, direct the CEO, legislative affairs, and intergovernmental relations branch um, Washington and Sacramento advocates to send a 
letter, a five signature letter to the federal and state legislative leadership support in support of a legislative proposal providing a comprehensive rent and mortgage relief programs for residents impacted by COVID-19 to ensure that. Advisor, just Mary Wickham from County Council is to send a letter. Okay, send, I'm sorry, send a letter. You're correct, it was it was stricken out. Send a letter um, and that it, comprehensive rent and mortgage relief programs for residents impacted by COVID-19 to ensure we are leveraging all available state and federal resources to support property owners and renters through the end of the safer at home order. That is my amendment. Um, okay, in, in that case, I, I don't know whether a five signature letter would be more appropriate or desirable, or if it's better just to go through our advocates. I believe it was my own concern about the rent forgiveness that led us to amend from a five sig to just a letter. Now, I don't know where everybody else is. So let me just say that with the amendment, I am okay on directive one. But um, on Directive 4, I know that uh, Supervisor Solis indicated she was kind of surprised that someone would um, object to a report back. But of course, you know, sometimes you get surprises in the middle of a meeting like I did on Item 3. So um, for Directive 4, I still don't want to give the impression that it is a good idea even to think about deferring the collection of property taxes. I feel very strongly about it and therefore would ask that Directive 4 be bifurcated. I would be happy to vote yes on the PACE issues, but I cannot support even asking for a report back on deferring the collection of property taxes. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Um, Supervisor Solis, any comments before we take the role, because I don't believe there's a second on bifurcating. No, Madam Chair, I second. To just go on. Okay. There's a second, so Madam let's, Chair. Okay, we'll, we'll take a, a vote on bifurcating the motion on item four. On item four. It's just, uh, it just was to bifurcate We're, directive four. No, um, so there's a second to bifurcate. Madam Executive Officer, would you take a role on whether or not to bifurcate um, Section 4 out of this? Okay. The, we're going to take a role on second in the, on the, to bifurcate item 4. Supervisor Solis? No. Supervisor Solis, no. Supervisor Willie Thomas? Aye. Supervisor Willie Thomas, aye. Supervisor Kuehl? Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn? I'm going to abstain on that one. Abstain. Supervisor Barger? No. No. Fails to pass. Uh, two to two with one abstention. You know, I have to say, I'm really, I'm really surprised. We have never, ever said to a member that you cannot vote separately on a piece, and every one of you has asked for it. I'm not sure I understand this. Executive Office. Celia, what is... What's, what, what's the tally of the votes? It's two, two, two no's, two eyes, and one abstention. I don't think it carried then. So no, it did not carry. It did not. Okay, we did not carry. Correct. The motion. Okay, motion fails to carry. Right. To bifurcate. Motion to bifurcate. Fail. Well, Madam Executive Officer, would you read or would you take the vote for the motion? As as amended. As amended. So, the remaining items as amended are before you. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Willie Thomas. Supervisor Willie Thomas, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. I don't understand what we're voting on. Is it the entire thing taken together? So I have to yeah. vote no if I'm against two things? So yeah, the following items are item, the directives item one, yeah. three, Five, six, seven, and eight, and four. And one, it's going to be as amended. 
well, if I'm not allowed to vote the way I wish on one piece of one directive, then I'm forced by the board to vote no on the whole thing. So no. Supervisor Kill, no. Supervisor Hahn. Yes. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Four, two, one. All right. So now we move on to item 51A, establishing a countywide program to reduce the court's failure to appear rate. And it was held by Supervisor Ridley Thomas. Supervisor Ridley Thomas. Hello, Madam Chair. Hello, Supervisor Ridley Thomas. Uh, the urgency of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, I think we'll all agree has caused the board and the County's justice partners to make unprecedented efforts to significantly, and I should add quickly, uh, reform its approach to criminal justice. And while there's much to be done, I think it's fair to say that's a good thing. Uh, this has included uh, the safe release of as many as 5,000 uh, inmates from uh, the county uh, jails. Importantly, Madam uh, Chair and colleagues, many of those recently released individuals have court dates coming up as soon as June. And additional steps must be taken to ensure that the county maintains this progress and prevents further spread of COVID-19. Uh, this pilot program uh, that's being proposed in the motion here will utilize technology text reminders to help ensure that defendants appear in court and avoid the various consequences of failing to appear, including among other things, being returned to jail. Uh, might I say this is about accountability uh, in the truest sense of the word. So this common sense approach uh, should make courtrooms and courthouses safer and keep the jail population down in an effort to, again, prevent the spread of COVID-19, while ultimately producing better outcomes for justice-involved individuals. The public defender, Madam Chair, Ricardo Garcia, has been championing this idea for a pilot, and I would now like to invite him to say a few words on the subject at hand with your permission. Thank you. Good morning, Supervisors. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning, and thank you, Supervisor Willie really Thomas, and actually for this entire board, your uh, leadership to assure the indigent accused of a voice and an opportunity to stay out of jail while they confront and address their cases. Um, last year, ATI plan asked us to reconceptualize the justice system within the larger public health framework. The COVID-19 pandemic forced the justice system to not just reconceptualize the system, but to truly embrace public health and care first, jails last as our new reality. In a paradigm shift that will help keep all Angelinos healthy, justice stakeholders worked together to safely reduce the jail population and help slow the spread COVID-19 amongst the men and women in custody. This motion will give deputy public defenders a valuable tool in protecting the pretrial rights of our clients who are out of custody and get them back to court on time. There is no question that facing accusations while in jail places the accused in a clear disadvantage and turns the presumption of innocence on its head. We know that forcing the state to prove its case against a free person results in a better and more equitable disposition and results for the accused. Being able to reach our clients and notify them about future court dates will undoubtedly reduce failures to appear, which will reduce the number of arrests and ultimately prevent refilling the jails with people who are there because they are poor and can't pay bail. I wanna thank you for this opportunity to speak. 
Thank you, Supervisor Hahn. Thanks, Madam Chair, and thanks, uh, Supervisor Ridley Thomas, for this motion. It's um, really a common sense motion. And big shout out to our public defender, uh, Ricardo Garcia. You've done such amazing work um, before this happened, but now you're you're working overtime to make sure that uh, you know you can make sure that our most vulnerable residents um, still have their constitutional rights in in the midst of this new normal. And uh, I, I love the common sense solution about sending text messages, reminders of upcoming court dates. Uh, it seems so simple. I'm really surprised we're not already doing this. I mean, I think about all of us in our lives, text messages remind us to do almost everything. We all get text reminders for uh, everything that we're involved in. We get text reminders about friends' birthdays. I mean, we just are reminded all the time through text. So this makes sense, particularly for the thousands of people who would normally be in jail awaiting trial, but are now going to be home awaiting their court dates uh, because we've uh, got zero bail for all nonviolent and non-serious offenses. I think this um, is another one of those um, solutions that LA County is going to be a model for the rest of the country. And if this is uh, successful, it could um, really give us more impetus uh, for laying groundwork for more permanent bail reform uh, to make sure that we keep people uh, from being locked up in uh, pretrial when they really don't need to be. So uh, good idea. Thank you, Supervisor Ridley Thomas, for bringing this forward. I support it 100%. And thanks again, Ricardo Garcia, for the work that you do every single day. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have any other people that want to speak on this item? With that, Madam Executive Officer, would you please read the names of those that submitted written testimony? Madam Chair, we have one individual who submitted comments in favor, and that is Joseph Mazelish. With that, hearing no other, Madam Executive Officer, would you please take the roll on this motion? The item before you is item 51A, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Billy Thomas. Aye. Supervisor Billy Thomas, aye. Supervisor Kill. Aye. Supervisor Kill, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Verizon Barger, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Now we will move on to item 51B, which is included with 51G and 51H, all related items, which was held by Supervisor Hahn. Thanks, Madam Chair, and thanks, Supervisor Solis, for joining me on this motion. Uh, so at our last meeting, we unanimously passed the supplemental paid sick leave for employees of large companies that have had to take time off for reasons related to this uh, pandemic. And today we're, we have two more ordinances before us that will ensure that workers who are in the janitorial, maintenance, security service, and hospitality industries that work in our unincorporated areas of LA County who are laid off due to the pandemic have the first right of recall to their jobs. And that ensures that they would get to keep their jobs in the event the business they work for gets sold because of the pandemic. And I think these added protections give our workers who have built careers and livelihoods in industries that have absolutely been decimated by this pandemic, gives them the peace of mind that as these businesses start to come back, their jobs will still be there for them. And as with the paid sick leave ordinance we passed, if the business has a collective bargaining agreement in place, then they would be exempt from this. We allow for workers five days to respond to a recall notice. Uh, and that was a bit of a compromise. I think originally we wanted 10 days, uh, but there were those who wanted 24 hours. So we compromised and we're gonna give five days for people to, to respond to a notice. But I'm pretty sure uh, people are really waiting for those notices to appear. And I, I'm sure they're gonna reply quickly if they know that they can get back to work. I want to make it clear that these ordinances leave it to the businesses as to what jobs they need to bring back and the timing for that and offer those jobs to the employees that meet the job description they need. 
If they need a dishwasher and a hotel clerk, for example, they aren't expected to bring back another type of employee simply because of seniority. And we talked a lot about whether or not these should expire. Um, and I believe they shouldn't expire, that there'll be evergreen ordinances. And I know, again, a lot of debate, a lot of discussion. We've met with business groups, with chambers, as well as those who uh, represent workers here in the county. And we talked a lot about what the city of LA has been doing and Long Beach. And we really like to, if we can, be consistent with them. So I didn't think putting an expiration date on these ordinances made sense. Uh, we have an unemployment rate that's 14.5% nationally. Some think it'll reach 20%. Um, and most experts say we will take a very long time to recover from that. Um, if at all. And so given that kind of uncertainty, I don't think it makes sense for these worker protections to end on an arbitrary date. But uh, I think we should assess the ordinances after they've taken effect. And so part of this is a requirement that our CEO report back to us uh, in two years on the ordinances, uh, March of 2022, and see if they've uh, been impactful. I have uh, read and heard, as I know all of you have, many, many stories of hotel employees losing their jobs because our hotels are mostly empty. I was informed that um, of 32,000 uh, hotel workers, only 500 of them are still working, uh, and that may change any day. Employees uh, in the other industries that this ordinance would apply to are facing the same grim reality of their jobs disappearing literally overnight. So I think passing this sends a good message to these workers um, that we see them, we hear them. I mean, we're all getting tired of hearing we're in this together, but we really are. And I think this ordinance says that in a big way. Um, so I, I hope I can get the support of my colleagues on this motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Solis. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And thank you, Supervisor Hahn, for authoring the motion. and inviting me to serve as your co-author. You know, this pandemic has highlighted the need to further strengthen protections for our workforce, particularly those on the front lines. And by adopting these permanent right of recall and worker retention policies, we ensure people have jobs to come back to once it's safe to go back to work. LA County hotels and building service companies have laid off tens of thousands of loyal workers in the past few months, sometimes firing people uh, who have worked there for decades, and I'm not talking one decade, two decades, but some as long as 30 years with no severance. And California, as you may know, is expected to be among the hardest hit states. According to the Economic Policy Institute, California is on track to shed over 600,000 jobs by summertime with high concentrations in leisure, hospitality, and the retail industries. As you know, workers in these industries are overwhelmingly people of color who are already severely impacted by the pandemic. 30 years ago, some of you might remember, SEIU launched the Justice for Janitors campaign, calling for improved wages and better working conditions, actually representing largely immigrants and people of color and many women. Almost 15 years ago in 2006, the historic Century Boulevard campaign was launched to improve working conditions and compensation for hotel housekeepers. The Century Boulevard campaign for a living wage helped lead Los Angeles City and hospitality living into a better policy, a wage policy was, that was then set to set the stage for a citywide and countywide living wage policy as recent as 2016. The policies today further assure laid off workers that they will be rehired after the crisis and be retained even if their place of employment changes ownership. This motion and urgency ordinances address this need by providing additional protections for our workers to ensure that they can feed their families and keep themselves safe if they are impacted by COVID-19. At our last board meeting, we approved a requirement that employers with over 500 employees nationally and are located within the unincorporated areas of the county would provide 80 hours of paid supplemental sick leave for full-time workers and up to two weeks paid for part-time employees of covid for COVID-19 reasons. 
Together, all of these ordinances will provide the necessary protection to our hardworking employees and their families. Most of all, I'm reminded that recently, while we have been uh, providing food banks, banking services around the county, many of those individuals that have arrived with their families were recently laid off from the hotel and restaurant industry. I can't forget that picture in my mind. So I know that we have to provide relief and some support for these individuals have, who have given us so much. So I ask my colleagues to support this motion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor Huell. Madam Chair, I support uh, these three uh, ordinances, but I have a question to the authors. Um, it's based on seniority to um, bring people back, which I think is appropriate. But I was thinking that occasionally, and maybe more than occasionally, uh, the person with seniority is also a per person who may be uh, older than some of the workers. And after I watched what happened at Tesla, where you know Elon Musk didn't really much care whether he was putting his workers at risk, he just told them to come back. The flip side of this kind of worries me. Uh, and I wonder if there is a senior worker and the employer says you can return to work under this ordinance and you have five days to let me know. If the senior worker is still worried about her health and her family's health uh, or has responsibilities and has sick leave still to use, could she say, I'd like to use up my sick leave and come back to work later and still hold her place? That's an excellent question. I, I, uh, I think the answer is yes. Yeah, I, I agree, Supervisor Hahn. I think that's really critical. It's important. Because yeah, there's no language. I mean, I don't really even have an amendment, but I was thinking about it after I watched all these sort of folks being forced to go back to work, which is the flip side, you know? So I think it's important for us yeah, to so you're, about yeah, how to you're right. Them. Yeah, and that was my that was our intent. So if we need to uh, get some language in there, good good catch, Supervisor Kuhl. Um, we can do that. Thank you. I do support these. Thank you. Okay. Um, can I just ask a question um, to the to the um, county, county council? I do think uh, as currently drafted, that issue is not addressed. Um, so uh, this is an opportunity to provide additional language. Um, Correct, and I and we'll provide that and present it. You want to vote? Who 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 will provide it? Who just said we'll provide it? Where does County Council? Oh, Nick. Oh, okay. So can I, can I ask some questions though before um, just to get clarification? Mm -hmm. uh, as it relates to the uh, punitive damages, I'm trying to, to understand um, what is the impact of including that and in the ordinance given all the business losses occurring right now. I just wanna understand what that means to a business as it relates to including that language. County Council. So this is Nicole Davis Tinkham speaking. And um, that, that language re referencing the punitive damages is only included in the right of recall ordinance. And before any worker files any action in a court of law, they must first give the employer a 15 day opportunity to cure. Um, once that time is exhausted, then all of the, um, the language relating to punitive damages is just another available remedy uh, to that worker in addition to other actual damages. Uh, but that worker would need to prove up in their court action um, that they are entitled to punitive damages to the level uh, required in the California Civil Code 3294, which is a very high standard. Okay, and then to, I, I guess to the authors, is there a reason why the um, infrastructure, telecommunications, education institutions, and temporary workers um, were not exempted from the two ordinances and what your thought process was? Because these are issues that were brought by the business community. And I just want to understand. I guess that means no. Honestly, yeah, I don't know, uh, Supervisor Solis, uh, 
uh, has any comments on this. I, I uh, we wanted to focus on hospitality. We wanted to focus, I think, yeah. mainly on yeah. hospitality. I think we wanted to focus on the maintenance worker, janitorial, individuals that are really like the folks that are most exposed. So they really are the folks okay. that are the ones mostly impacted right now. Um, and that's what we what our intent was. Got it. Got it. So and then and then Sweater Hunt, I know you talked about the um sunset clause. And my only concern is that with these ordinances will encourage businesses possibly to declare bankruptcy rather than rather than to sell or reorganize. And I just want to know um, to county council, if that were to happen, would that negate the need for, I mean, what would the impact be on the workers if they decided to declare bankruptcy? Would they be held responsible for these employees? It's unclear at this time. Um, we could include that in a report back. Yeah, because I mean, that, that's my concern, because what I'm hearing is um, that businesses are saying um, that that they're looking at their options as it relates to anything that's done that would impact their business in order to um, and then just possibly reorganize down the line. I don't know. Um, but those are my concerns. And and with that, Supervisor Hahn, you said that that um, there was a compromise. So that went from 10 to five. Was who was who was the comp who was compromising on that? I just think that a lot of the business groups had brought um, concerns about the 10 day um, and uh, and basically the idea was, boy, when they're ready to reopen, they're ready to reopen. And if they had to wait 10 days to hear back from uh, those that were protected under this ordinance, it would be too long. And so they wanted 24 hours, like, let's give people 24 hours. If they don't respond, we'll move on to the next person. And so we just, we felt like five days was a good in between those two. And I- Okay, got it. Well, also, oh, go ahead, sorry. That's also what I heard as well, that five was kind of the compromise. 10 was maybe a bit, and anything less than that wasn't, wasn't agreeable. So five was kind of where we thought it was a, a good medium. Okay, so I, I would ask, and I, I, I'm sensing from the answers that it's probably not gonna, uh, accepted but a friendly amendment that would ask that that five days be two days um or i'd even go well i i think two days is reasonable and then regarding number two remove the language related to punitive damage for laid off workers who bring an action and i would ask that the sunset date be to december 31st 2020 or at the end of, of the safer at home order or even extend um 30 days beyond the safer at home order in order to protect those employees um, that uh, that are businesses that are slowly coming back up and working. So I would ask that that be considered as an amendment. I love you dearly, Madam Chair, but I, I don't think I can accept those um, amendments. I didn't think so. I just wanted to go on the record stating that I have those concerns and I wanted to try to amend it to address the business community who is saying that some of the actions being taken are going to be detrimental to business in LA County, but um, I understand that. Amendments um, fail failed due to lack of second. Okay, so with that, does anyone else want to talk on that? And then I also on the Amendment 51 agents were taking it. Um, I, I know that the punitive damage and the sunset date will not be accepted on that either. So I just want to go on record saying that, that I'm, I have concerns about that as well. Madam Chair, this is Mary Wickham from County Council. As to the issue raised by uh, Supervisor Kuehl, one option for the board to address that issue is to amend the motion to seek a report back from County Council within 14 days as to that issue. Uh, and then <clears throat> depending on the report back, the board could at a later time amend the ordinance to address it. We move such an amendment if that's acceptable. Uh, yeah, I would second that, and I would I would accept that amendment. But we still move forward and vote on this thing, but it will be as amended and part of the and the amendment would be the report back in fourteen days. Correct. But it, wouldn't, right. hold, it wouldn't hold up the ordinance necessarily. Okay. So, seeing that no one else has requested to speak, um, Madam Executive Officer, would you 
please read in the names of those who signed up or submitted written testimony on this item. The following individuals submitted comments on agenda item numbers 51B, 51G, and 51H. Those in favor, John Erickson, Jessica Cowley, Celia Dure, Corey Niss, Sarah Carano, Edgar Ortiz, Miranda Labig, Marissa Nuncio, Kristen Schwartz, Rostin Wu, Haley Potiker, Alicia Hancock, Ashley Thomas, Robin, Keisha Wade, Michael Racanelli, Christian Cardenas, Hannah Hickson, Erica Briss, Bethany Leal, Joseph Mazlish, Brady Collins, Nisha Joshi, Christy Lees, Kelsey Collins, Colleen Evanson, Rosemary Jenkins, Alexander Fierro Clark, Scott Austin, Stephen Solomon, Angel Castillo, Chelsea Turkios, Mary Jack, Carol Tom, Andy Seymour, Betty Hung, Alexandra Sue, David Levitas, Rabea Sen, Kiran Kim, Esme Germain, Kui Kim, Amy Wong, Wong Yong Wang, Jennifer Castro, Hannah Murphy, Greg Spiegel, Celia Nava, Yoon Young Pong, Diane Prado, Janice Yu, Saren Kirschbaum, David Ricardo Abud, Jun Shin, Andrea Gonzalez, Yelena Zeltzer, Pilar Schiavo, Samantha Honowitz, Ji Xiao Yang, Alexis Perez, Sergio Vargas, Laura Raymond, Stanislav Shekman, Sandy Sanchez, Laura Raymond, Andra Moss, Sefi Zin, Hassan Zuniga, Maria Del Rosarito Martinez, and the following submitted under opposed, Christina Boss, Todd Johnson, Kian Zerinman, Robert Lapsey, Clara Carger, Armando Flores, and the following submitted under other, Karenjo Goodwin, Brooke Saunders, Toby Malara, Gabriel Prado, Dan Struve, Jaime Garcia, and Jacob Horegwe. That is all the members. Thank you. So Madam Executive Officer, would you please read what we will be voting on? Okay, item 51B, 51G, 51H with the amendments for a report by, by County Council is before you. Mm -hmm. Supervisor Solis? Aye. Supervisor Solis? Aye. Supervisor Solis? Aye. Supervisor Riley Thomas? Aye. Supervisor Riley Thomas? Aye. Supervisor Kill? Aye. Supervisor Kill? Aye. Supervisor Hahn? Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger? Abstain. Supervisor Barger, abstain. Motion carries four to zero with one abstention. Okay, with that, um, thank you all very much. Now we're going to move on to item A1, which are items continued from previous board meetings for further discussion and action by the board. Supervisor Ridley Thomas, you held A1. I did, Madam Chair. Um, colleagues, I think it's well known to us uh, at this point that, that the uh, the sheriff recently announced plans to uh, close the Marina del Rey and Altadena stations. And, mm -hmm. uh, and these closures directly affect constituents in three supervisorial districts. And I thank uh, Madam Chair for co-authoring this motion uh, with me, uh, it is unclear uh, how and why these two stations were selected for closure and how their closure will help balance the sheriff's budget. It is unclear how and why. I simply want to say that these changes were uh, done without any appropriate advance uh, input or notice from the communities that would be impacted and without proper analysis by the CEO uh, to validate both the potential cost savings and whether uh, public safety would be impacted. And I guess I just simply have to say this type of uh, unilateral and unvetted action, uh, which could have far reaching absolutely unnecessary and unanticipated impacts on services and shortchange uh, those communities of the public safety that they uh, should enjoy and have a right to lay claim to. This, by any standard of measurement, Madam Chair, is highly problematic. And that's why I'm reading uh, in this motion for immediate action today as follows. The sheriff should achieve the cost savings and budget curtailments needed to address uh, the department's deficit 
and counties revenue shortfall in a more transparent, more collaborative, might I add, in a more democratic way without jeopardizing services uh, to communities throughout the county of Los Angeles. I therefore move that the Board of Supervisors uh, direct the sheriff to immediately cease efforts to close stations as announced on May 4th, 2020 without any county vetting, uh, without any validation, without any advance notice to the impacted communities and the respective uh, Los Angeles County departments and without considering uh, the impact uh, to uh, public safety. Um, secondly, then we would direct the sheriff in consultation with the chief executive officer and the auditor controller to identify appropriate budget curtailments that are properly vetted and will have limited impact on public safety. I submit that for our unanimous consideration uh, today, Madam Chair. Thank you. And I want to thank you, Supervisor Julie Thomas, for uh, allowing me to co-author this motion with you. Both my downtown and San Gabriel Valley office have been inundated with calls and emails regarding the sheriff's announcement that it will close the Althea and the Marina Del Rey stations. Um, I've made it clear to them that there are other options that were provided, but the sheriff um, has refused to sit down and discuss better ways to address the deficit as a result of overspending in his department. And I personally was astounded that this announcement came truly out of nowhere during a time when people are already full of anxieties relates to COVID-19 and the insensitivity toward bringing this forward with really no explanation other than um, the board is making me do this when, it, when in fact, um, you know, it's quite the opposite. This board has been completely supportive of sitting down and working on ways to plug the financial gap that is currently in place in that department. And rather than do that, the number grows more. And so I, I truly believe that, um, that this was done in a way to, uh, to underscore for the sheriff um, the fact that, that he believes that he has the ability within his own budget to make these decisions. But what I tell my constituents is they have a voice and I want them to use their voice and I will stand with them in um, ensuring that that public safety, especially the front line, is not compromised as a result of, of decisions that are made um, in the dead of dark without further, without full discussion and transparency. So I am honored to support this, I mean, to co-opt this motion and support it as well. So with that, um, Supervisor Hahn, would you like to speak? I would, Madam Chair, thanks. Um, and, and thank you, uh, Supervisor Ridley Thomas uh, uh, and Supervisor Barger for your remarks as well. Uh, and I'm with you, right? I, I didn't even know this was coming. Uh, this was announced at a press conference and I don't even think anybody um, at the station was aware of this announcement. And I've also been getting a lot of um, calls into my office about the Marina Del Rey station, which by the way is unique because uh, it actually also encompasses the Harbor Master as well as all the sheriff's uh, boat patrol uh, that is out there. And, and people are wondering how this would Im impact that. The Harbor Master is a very important uh, detail that uh, really all the crafts and all the boaters in the Marina Del Rey really depend on uh, to uh, keep order out there. So this came as a big surprise. And I, I just really want if the public is listening, uh, because I'm sensing that the public might say, gee, you know, you're telling the sheriff to make cuts. And then when he does make the cuts, we, we push back. Uh, but I want them to know that this is not at all how we uh, have wanted to do this. Uh, we've asked the sheriff to come forward with hypothetical cuts and hypothetical scenarios on how the budget uh, deficit would be reduced. Then 
uh, we would all talk about it. And uh, the CEO would be involved in saying, okay, that's a good suggestion, but we've been looking at uh, another area where you could also make cuts that would equal the same amount of money, but maybe not as impactful to our constituents. So uh, these curtailment plans have always been hypothetical until we had a chance to actually vet them and talk about them. Uh, the, you know, the priority is certainly to identify ways to reduce the sheriff's budget, but to do it in a way that's not going to impact public safety. And I think closing stations does just that. So I'm hoping, and I just wanna go on record saying that I think closing stations should be an absolute uh, last resort. Uh, there are a lot of other things that we've already begun to identify uh, that we think can save money, but would not be so drastic. So uh, thank you for this motion. And I say it every time and I mean it. I do look forward to working with the sheriff collectively to find ways to um, do what every other department in the county is doing. And that's uh, come up with ways to um, you know, reduce their budgets as we move through this pandemic. So um, thank you for doing this and I'm supportive of this motion. Thank you, Supervisor Solis. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Ridley Thomas and, and Barger for bringing the motion before us. I agree that uh, curtailments by all our departments should be vetted by the CEO. And that also includes the Sheriff's Department, especially given their existing deficit. And it's the county's longstanding process for the CEO to review all curtailment scenarios before submitted by our departments and provide the board with some recommendations. That hasn't happened. This helps to ensure that curtailments are collectively considered so that reductions are prioritized to do the least harm to critical services for our communities and our neighbors that we serve and that we also employ in these different programs. In addition, to the patrol station closures, the sheriff also identified several other programs that would be cut because of because they were underfunded or, or unfunded. One such program is the Homeless Outreach Service Teams, or HOST, which has been instrumental during the pandemic and proven very effective uh, by many of us, knowing that they have built trust between our communities and people experiencing homelessness with our departments. And, and, I, and I know many of you here have worked on the board to make available through AB 109 funding to establish the host and the board approved $6.6 .6 million to fund host through this fiscal year. So I don't understand why all of a sudden there are positions that are now being removed. Uh, I would urge the sheriff department to also continue maintaining this successful program. And additionally, I relayed to the sheriff my displeasure in a recent letter that I sent last week, many of the positions that he proposed to reassign or eliminate that specifically serve the unincorporated areas in my own district. And in fact, these positions are funded through my discretionary funds. And I wanna mention some of them. Nuisance abatement services in East Los Angeles, which I have funded since taking office, and I'm now paying $476,000 annually for. The town sheriffs from the industry station, which I have funded since 2018 to serve the communities, unincorporated areas of Avocado Heights, Bassett, and Valinda to the tune of $1 million. And in addition to that, the Parks Bureau, which I funded $216,000 annually for early morning patrols at our parks in my district, as well as $47,000 for security services at the Bassett Winter Shelter and the Community Partnership Bureau, which I funded at 2.5 million each year for the unincorporated areas of my district. I strongly agree that the Sheriff Department, like all departments, need to be required to work with the CEO prior to implementing any curtailments, and that review should include not only the closures of the two stations, but all the proposed cuts put forth by the Sheriff. And I believe uh, that this is something that um, is included in the motion on item two, direct the sheriff in, consult in consultation with the chief executive officer and auditor, auditor controller to identify appropriate budget curtailments that are properly vetted and will have limited impact on our public safety. Thank you very much. Thank you. With that, Supervisor, or I'm sorry, Sachi Hamai, would you like to say something, please? Yes, oh, um, 
Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, yes, as all of you know, we have asked every department, including the Sheriff's Department, to put together a 10, 15, 20% curtailment package and submit it to our office. Um, we started last week and we are continuing through the end of this week to go through every department's curtailment packages. We are putting together a comprehensive list that we will bring um, to your board for consideration about the overall curtailments um, that will match the, uh, the approximate $1 billion uh, deficit that we are facing next year. With respect to just the Sheriff's Department, I will say in his curtailment package, um, he does not uh, recommend closing any stations. That was not part of it. I will say he did recommend reducing the number of patrol deputies, but those patrol deputies that he's re recommending um, for curtailment were um, positions that we had added since 2015. There's a base number of deputies that were already assigned to all of the unincorporated areas. Those would stay intact. We had added starting from 2015 about 85 additional patrol deputies in the unincorporated area. And his one of his recommendations was to eliminate those positions. Again, we haven't made final decisions. We're looking at all of the packages, but that uh, with that one recommendation of the unincorporated area patrol, it would not um, close down any, uh, uh, any of the stations. And as a matter of fact, for Marina Del Rey, if we did move forward with his recommendation just to eliminate his additional patrol deputies since 2015, he would still have 38 uh, patrol deputies. In the Altadena station, he would still have 26 deputies um, that would remain. So I'm not sure why um, the sheriff is recommending full closure at this point in time because that's not what he has submitted in his package. We continue to look at other areas. I know Supervisor Solis indicated the host team and other programs. I think um, we will have to uh, continue to go through and determine um, how deep the curtailments are, are overall for the county, but certainly um, we would bring it back to your board for consideration. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sachi. Supervisor Ridley. Uh, Supervisor Ridley Thomas, before that, Supervisor Kuehl would like to say something. Supervisor Kuehl? Madam Chair, I, uh, we've also had an ongoing issue recently with the sheriff where he has identified um, some need uh, that came kind of out of his own head, I think, um, to send his deputies to the uh, homes of children who did not log on for their education with uh, LA Unified and other districts. Uh, and he said he was doing that in partnership with the Department of Children and Family Services. But as Director Cagle reported, there was no such partnership. And indeed DCFS has its own social workers in contact with their children and does not want law enforcement to go banging on people's doors uh, about this. The sheriff also indicated he was working in partnership with LACO, but, um, Director Duardo indicated there was no such partnership and they did not want to release any names to him of children because many times there are reasons why they can't log on. They don't have the technology or you know, things that we've been reading about in the paper and are trying to fix. So um, perhaps that's a good area for curtailment because no one wants those deputies to be banging on people's doors. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Supervisor Ridley Thomas. Uh, thank you very much, um, Madam Chair. It just simply feels like two stations have been targeted uh, without explanation, without criteria, without a rationale uh, that any member of this board, for example, is aware of. The principal persons responsible for uh, the fiscal health of the county, uh, which would include all departments, there are no exceptions, irrespective of whether uh, the department head is 
elected or not. Might I remind everyone uh, that uh, there are two other elected officials who run departments, specifically uh, the assessor and uh, the DA. Um, it is curious uh, to me that we uh, have a, a back and forth exchange with those uh, two offices that is um, during our uh, budget deliberation processes. Uh, CEO uh, works with the designated entities in those offices and yet um, uh, to in some way hide behind the uh, veneer of autonomy um, as it relates to uh, imposing a, a point of view uh, on the board um, is as revealing as it can possibly be. I do not know uh, what uh, the people of View Park, I do not know what the people of Windsor Hills, I do not know what the people of uh, Ladera Heights uh, would have done to earn the animus of the sheriff in such a way that he would unilaterally propose shutting down their uh, public safety option. I can tell you this, I will never submit to that sort of intimidation. And Madam Chair, I, I would reject out of hand the adoption of a budget that would close any of our uh, sheriff stations um, at this point in time because it is unwarranted, it is unthoughtful, and it is fundamentally unacceptable. Madam Chair, I respectfully request and I vote on the item before us. I will second that. Madam Executive Officer, would you please? The item yeah. before you is item A1. Um, let's, let's, we're gonna call the speakers. Oh, I'm sorry, that speakers that have signed up on A1, Madam Executive Officer, and submitted written testimony for the record. Following submitted in favor, Park Mowers, Zivia Sweeney, Lee Bailey, and the following submitted under other, Andrea Lear, Sharon Powell, and Ricardo Perez. Very good, I apologize. Now, Madam Executive Officer, will you please uh, call the roll? The item before you is A1, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Billy Thomas. Aye. Supervisor Billy Thomas, aye. Supervisor Kill. Aye. Supervisor Kill, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Very good, thank you. Uh, now there are no specials at this time, so we will move on to adjournments beginning with Supervisorial District number two. I thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, may I ask uh, that when we adjourn uh, today, we adjourn in memory of Dr. Carrie English. Dr. English was born on October the 2nd, 1945 in Jacksonville, Florida and passed away on April the 27th here in Los Angeles at the age of 74. As a young child, he, he relocated to Los Angeles with his family when his father accepted a job as an aer aeronautical engineer. And Dr. Inglis completed his undergraduate studies at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri and moved to Los Angeles then to uh, attend uh, UCLA School of Medicine where he received his degree in 1970. And upon completion of an overseas fellowship at King's College in London, um, uh, Dr. English returned to the States for a three-year residency in the uh, pediatric unit at Harbor UCLA Medical Center and a two-year um, child development fellowship at the Yale uh, Child Study Center in New Haven, Connecticut. It was then in 1976 he settled in Los Angeles yet again and joined uh, the faculty of the Charles R. Drew University of Medicine and Science. And while there, he served as the chief of the Child Development Division and as the director of the Development of Pediatrics Fellowship Program at the King Drew Medical Center. He later became the medical director of the MLK Pediatric Hub, where he provided critical medical evaluations for children. Overall, 
uh, Dr. English practiced pediatrics for more than 40 years, and nearly all that time in the community of South Los Angeles. He was a long time board member of organizations such as the Drew uh, Child Development Corporation and Shields for Families. Uh, Dr. English also served on several local theater companies, including the 24th Street Theater, the Cornerstone uh, Theater Company, Ojai Play uh, Rights Conference, and the Rogue Machine. Uh, he will be remembered for his years of leadership as a compassionate physician and as a devoted uh, theater patron and a supporter uh, who sometimes saw more than five shows a week. Uh, I think he got you beat, uh, Supervisor Kuehl. And so then Dr. English is survived by his wife, Olga, the former interim director of the Ford Theater, his two sons, Gavin and Mark, a daughter, Gina, two grandsons, Noah and Farrell, extended family, friends, and former colleagues who will all miss Dr. Kerry English most assuredly. May I now I'd like to join, if I may, on that? Thank you. Mark, thank you. And then there's Dr. Bar there's, uh, Barbara J. Hopper, the wife of Dr. Con Hopper. She was born on January the 19th, 1939, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and passed away on March the 26th uh, here in Los Angeles at the age of 81 due to complications from the coronavirus. While in high school, she excelled in her academics and was selected as an ambassador to represent the city of Milwaukee on a European tour for students. She attended the University of Wisconsin-Madison and pursued a degree in social work. She met her future husband, again, Dr. Cornelius Hopper, um, of renown in the UC system as the provost for health campuses across the state, Dr. Hopper was. And that was while he was interning uh, at Milwaukee County Hospital. Uh, they married in 1964. And when Mrs. Hopper's family relocated to Tuskegee, Alabama, she helped to start the Tuskegee Laboratory and Learning Center, an alternative school for children and others in response to the poor quality of education in uh, many of those communities. And therefore, Mrs. Hopper later became a licensed real estate agent and started her own company known as New Horizons Realty. She continued that work uh, when her family relocated to Oakland. And over the next four decades, became a top producing Bay Area agent at prestigious firms uh, throughout that region. She was also passionate about inspiring minority youth to become interested in health sciences and created workshops to bring them together with health professionals so that they could be mentored in careers in the medical field. Mrs. Hopper was a dedicated member of the church by the sea of the road, her home church in Berkeley and the Oakland uh, Barrier Links uh, enjoyed her support. She was a founder of the Contra Costa chapter of Jack and Jill and served as the auxiliary to the Golden State Medical Association and president of that auxiliary and to the Sinclair Miller Medical Association. She will be remembered for her strong first faith, her entrepreneurial talents, her dedication to youth, and her lifelong love for traveling. She is survived by her husband of 55 years, Dr. Cornelius Hopper, trustee emeritus of Drew University of Medicine and Science, uh, daughter Adrienne, uh, two sons, Brian and Michael, two grandchildren. Olivia and uh, Darian, extended family and friends, all of whom will miss her dearly. And I finally uh, would like to ask that we adjourn in memory of Robin Ross, uh, who recently passed away, and our condolences go out to her family. She was a member and heavily involved in. Like to as well, please. I would also like to join. Thank All you. Members, please. Uh, she was a member 
and heavily involved in the St. Mark's Episcopal Church and served on the board for the Center for Community Solutions, a San Diego-based organization that works to end relationship and sexual violence. Ms. Ross is survived by her husband, Dr. Robert K. Ross, President and Chief Executive Officer of the California Endowment. Uh, we extend uh, deepest condolences to the entirety of that family, um, a network of friends uh, clear across the nation, all of whom will miss a Robin Ross most assuredly. And then, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Lily Lane Matlin Spies, born in January of 1932 here in Los Angeles and passed in April here in Los Angeles at the age of 88. She was married to Pastor Lloyd C. Spies for 47 years, and together they raised five children. Ms. Spies was a 33-year member of the Oroville Unified School District she was a dedicated member and president of uh, that board for 16 years. She will be remembered as a warrior, a great cook, a community leader, and a servant. And her strong faith carried her through. She survived her children, including Lori Gay, president and CEO of the Neighborhood Housing Services of LA County, uh, her extended family and friends, all of whom will miss her most assuredly. Thank you very kindly, Madam Chair. That concludes my uh, adjournments for the day. Thank you, Supervisor Ridley Thomas. Supervisor Kuhl. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Lynn Carroll. He was a Grammy-winning cellist who died on April 27. Over the course of his wide-ranging career, performed as a soloist with just about every major orchestra in the United States and Europe. He was widely beloved as a generous chamber music colleague, a respected teacher, and a musician's musician. He and his wife, Helen Nightingale, founded the Heartbeats Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization that strives to help children in need harness the power of music to better cope with and recover from the extreme challenges of poverty and conflict. Among the institutions where he taught are London's Royal Academy of Music, the Cleveland Institute of Music, Juilliard, USC Thornton School of Music, and Rice University's Shepherd School of Music. He also served as music director of the Los Angeles Philharmonic Institute, which is a summer training program. He survived by his wife, Helen. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Gil Schwartz, CBS executive who died on May 2nd. He headed CBS's corporate communications department from 1996 to 2018, but also moonlighted as a successful humor columnist and author. He went by the pseudonym Stanley Bing, and his columns and books parodied the business and the media world in which he worked. He survived by his brother Michael, his wife Laura, his daughter Nina, his son Will, his stepson Kyle, and his stepdaughter Rachel. And I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Sam Lloyd, who played a lawyer Ted Buckland on Scrubs and was a popular recurring character, appearing in almost half of the show's episodes from 2001 to 2009. He also had a recurring role on Desperate Housewives as Dr. Albert Goldfein made notable appearances on other shows, including Malcolm in the Middle, The West Wing, Modern Family, and Seinfeld. His movie appearances included Galaxy Quest and Flubber. And he was also the nephew of Back to the Future star Christopher Lloyd, who survived by his wife Vanessa and his son Weston. And I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Suzanne Espaturian, who died on April 25th. Born in Vienna, she emigrated to the U.S. with her family in 1939, escaping the horrors of Nazi-occupied Austria. She attended Hollywood High School and UCLA, receiving her B.A. in International Relations. She worked as an administrator at the B.A. Hospital, UCLA, and the Los Angeles Business Council. 
She's survived by her daughter, Heidi. And also, Ms. Aspeturian was the mother of my justice deputy, Nancy Aspeturian, who predeceased her. And so Suzanne is also, of course, survived by Nancy's wife and children. Uh, and I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Joel Rogerson and the award-winning TV producer who died on April 21st. His three-decade TV producing career included the 1980s crime-fighting TV staple Knight Rider and Magnum P.I. Inclusion was very important to him, and he always advocated for representation by people with disabilities in all his shows. He also taught writing at colleges and in a program for prisoners, as well as at a Writers Guild of America diversity program and the Performing Arts Theater for the Handicapped. He's survived by his wife, Deborah, and three daughters. And I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Peter Hunt, who rose to prominence in 1969 when he directed the inaugural Broadway production of 1776 with a cast that included William Daniels and Betty Buckley. The show logged more than 1,200 performances in its three-year run, won three Tony Awards, including Best Musical, Best Performance by a Featured Actor, and Best Director. Hunt's television credits include episodes of Baywatch, Touched by an Angel, and four feature adaptations in the Peabody Award-winning Mark Twain series on PBS, including The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, and Life on the Mississippi. He's survived by his wife, Barbette, their children, Max, Daisy, and Amy, and his brother, George. And I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Jerry Stiller, great actor, wonderful comedian, who passed away on May 11th, just yesterday. Together with his wife, Ann Mira, they formed a comedy team, Stiller and Mira, which appeared on many, many TV shows, including more than 30 times on The Ed Sullivan Show. The couple also starred in their own sitcom, The Stiller and Mira Show. His signature role came in, 19, in the 1990s when he played Frank Costanza on the show Seinfeld. His performance won him an American Comedy Award as well as an Emmy nomination. And not long after his time on Seinfeld ended, he took a role playing Arthur Spooner on the show the King of Queens. He survived by his two children, Ben Stiller and Amy Stiller. And finally, I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Etta Leder, who survived Auschwitz and the Bergen-Belsen concentration camps, stealing food to feed herself and other prisoners. She was one of 60,000 people who marched back to Germany from the Soviet Union in winter without any coats, without any shoes. Her story was archived by the Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles, the Holocaust Museum in Washington, and the USC Shoah Foundation. She, she survived by her three children, Reuben, Miriam, and Geraldine. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Hahn. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn, and this is a sad one for me, the Honorable Jim Edwards, who is a, currently he was a council member in Cerritos. He was a former mayor. Uh, Jim Edwards, he passed away at the age of 75. Jim served in the United States Army, including a year in Vietnam. He was retired from a 40-year career as a teacher and administrator in the ABC Unified School District. Uh, he was elected to the Cerrito City Council in 2005, 2009, 2015, and 2020, and he served as mayor twice. He and his wife, Connie, just celebrated their 52nd wedding anniversary last year. They've lived in Cerritos for more than 43 years. He was remarkably dedicated. He was an inspiring leader who so loved serving the city of Cerritos. And he will be remembered for his tireless dedication, his professionalism, and his concern for the community. He was at almost every event happening in community. He made so many contributions to making the city of Cerritos a better place. Um, and he will be profoundly missed. Uh, he was a friend of mine and I certainly will miss him. He survived by his dear wife, Connie, his son, Scott, daughter, Stacy, six grandchildren and one great grandson, Jim Edwards, rest in peace. 
Also moved that when we adjourn, we adjourn the memory of the Honorable Tom Clark, who was 93 when he just passed away. He was um, a longtime resident of Long Beach, graduated from Wilson High School during World War II, and he joined the Army. Uh, when he returned, uh, he attended Long Beach City College, and then he earned his degrees at UC Berkeley. He had a career as an optometrist while he was working as an elected official. He was 30 years on the city council in Long Beach, including seven years as mayor and 16 years on the Long Beach Community College Board of Trustees. His 46 years of elected public service continues to stand as the longest record in Long Beach. Uh, among his many accomplishments, Tom served as mayor when the former city hall was dedicated in 1976. And in that same year, he was inducted into the LBCC Hall of Fame for Community Leadership. And in, 20, in 2007, he was inducted into the LBCC Hall of Champions for track and field. He's survived by his wife, Ruth, his daughter, Carol, his sons, Paul and Jim, and two grandchildren. Also move that when we adjourn, we adjourn the memory of Donald Aptman, who was 89. He passed away due to complications with COVID-19. He was a U.S. Air Force veteran and a musician. He performed with the military band as well as professionally. He was also a radio disc jockey in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, his nephew, Al Lay, called me to tell me about Don's death. Al's one of my appointees to the Beach and Harbor Commission. Uh, Don and Al's father were best friends, so he and his sister Amy thought of Don as their uncle, and he referred to him as Uncle Don. Uh, Don is survived by his sister Mona and his niece and nephew, Amy and Al. May he rest in peace. I move that we also uh, adjourn today in the memory of Lois Brestoff. Lois was born in New York, and she learned to sew on buttons at the age of three. And later, she took that love of buttons and graduated from the San Jose State University uh, here in California with a degree in clothing and textiles. She taught for stretch and sew fabrics and was an educational representative for the Pellon Corporation. She was a longtime member of the San Fernando Valley Quilt Association and was its president for two years. She was a major player in our quilt guild and she had boundless energy and was always ready to help people. Many of you might have uh, known her. She was married to Nick Brestop, uh, who's a retired attorney. She had two sons, Daniel and Jonathan, and uh, even when she was pregnant with Jonathan, she earned a Juris Doctor degree from Loyola uh, Law School here in Los Angeles. Nick and Lois later formed Moskowitz, Brestoff, Blinderman, and Winston. Uh, I, they did so, both of Nick and Lois did so much uh, contributing to STEM education. They worked on the early development of the Discovery Pavilion, which became the Discovery Cube. Nick and um, my brother, uh, Judge Hahn, met when they were both assistant city attorneys for the city of LA. And Nick and Lois worked in many campaigns here in Los Angeles. Um, they worked in my brother's campaign when he ran for city controller, city attorney. He, they worked in Rick Tuttle for city council. Uh, Lois worked in Gil Garcetti for district attorney's campaign, Yvonne Burks for Congress and supervisor. And they worked on my campaign when I ran for LA city council. They were so involved, both politically, uh, socially uh, in our town, and um, we're really gonna miss her. And I know Nick is sad to have lost her. She survived by Nick, their two children, five grandchildren, and her sister, Marilyn. I also move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Lance Hughes, um, who uh, was, he and his family settled in San Pedro, uh, when he was young, he attended San Pedro High School and went on to graduate with a business degree from Long Beach State. He was a member of the Elks Club of San Pedro. And for most of his childhood and adulthood, he resided here in San Pedro and um, some of the other beach cities, Redondo, Hermosa, Manhattan. He loved um, surfing, skiing, running, hiking. He had, he had a great love of sports cars. I got to know Lance because his mother, Anne, and Lance's stepfather, Dick, uh, lived a couple doors down from me. 
in South Shores. And uh, I got to know Lance and um, saw how much he loved living life. Lance is survived by his brothers, Tom Hughes Jr., Tim Craig, Bill Craig, his sister Diana DeMarty, as well as his longtime girlfriend, Mariana Lopez. Uh, Lance will really be missed. I also move that when we adjourn, we adjourn in the memory of Charles Chuck Davis, who was a resident of Torrance. Um, he passed away at the age of 77. He graduated from the University of San Francisco, he served in the Air Force for 20 years, and he had more than 25 years experience in radio, television, and print media. Chuck also held a civil service TV motion liaison specialist position for 21 years, and he's survived by his wife, Kathleen, their two sons, Paul and Mark, grandchildren, Lena and Chase, and his brother, Billy. Also moved that we adjourn in the memory of Frank Schaefer, um, who was a Palos Verdes Estates resident, passed away at the age of 93. He was the founder and president of Frank Schaefer Publications, a leading educational materials publisher. And for 24 years, he was an elementary school teacher for the Palos Verdes Unified School District. Frank also worked part-time for Pepperdine University, teaching graduate courses. Um, he, when he turned 18, he was called up for service in the Army, and he was shipped out to Europe as a private. He served as the radio man for his infantry union and then was promoted to corporal and transferred to counterintelligence. He was in Paris on VE Day, and he was mobbed by a celebratory crowd and hosted high on joyous French shoulders. Frank was always proud to have served the country he loved. He survived by his wife, Marilyn, and their five sons, 12, 12 grandchildren and one great grandchildren. I also move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn the memory of Jeanette um, Barron, who was also a resident of Palos Verdes Estate. She was 93 when she passed away. She attended the University of Southern California, where she was a member of Alpha Delta Pi, the Key and Scrolls Club. And during her senior year, she was vice president of the student body graduating Phi Beta Kappa. She remained a decades long volunteer for the university, even serving as president of Trojan League of South Bay. USC honored her twice, uh, awarding her the Alumni Service Award and the Distinguished Service Award. She and her husband raised their family in Palos Verdes Estates, and she was preceded in death by her husband of 69 years, John. She survived by her son, John, and her daughter, Lynn, four grandchildren, and four great-grandchildren. I'm also um, sad to adjourn today in the memory of Mary Sutton, who was 92, uh, lived in San Pedro. Uh, Mary um, was uh, the mother of Mona Sutton and um, saw her many times. Uh, Mona would bring her mom and uh, her partner, Leslie, was always there at trainees um, and we would see them eating together. She was always smiling, lovely. Um, Mary always lit up the room when she was there, and Mona was such a good daughter to her uh, all her years. She was preceded in death by her daughter, Kathy. She survived by daughters, Patricia and Mona, and her daughter-in-law, Leslie, three grandchildren, 10 great-grandchildren, and two great-great-grandchildren. Last one, uh, move that we adjourn in the memory of Roger Emmett Ryan, who was 97, and he was passed away in Cerritos. Um, he was an aerial gunner trainer in the United States Army Air Force during World War II. He was honorably discharged after four years at the rank of sergeant. He held several jobs after his service and finally developed his own trucking company. In 1957, he decided to sell his company and move to Florida. There he met his wife, Mary Ann. Um, they moved to LA in 1960 and the majority of Roger's career was spent in the automobile sales industry. They moved to Cerritos in 1968, bought a home, raised their two children there. His proudest achievement in life was his family. He was a member of St. Linus Church in Norwalk, and he was also a member of the Cerritos Rod and Gun Club. He survived by his loving wife, Marion, his two children, Sean and Kathy, four grandchildren, one great granddaughter, and his sister, Jerry Mayan. That's all for me, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Hahn. I move that when we adjourn, adjourn today, we do so in memory of Jerry Bloom, a longtime resident of Santa Clarita who passed away at the age of 76. 
He was born in Los Angeles and graduated from William S. Hart High School in 1961. When he was 17, he enlisted in the U.S. Navy. He later became an ordained minister and served in that capacity for 59 years. Since 1996, he served in the Salvation Army in its social service, adult drug and alcohol rehabilitation and spiritual programs. He accepted an appointment as the officer in charge of the Salvation Army Santa Clarita Court six years ago. He expanded all services through his effective and inspirational leadership. Jerry is survived by his wife, Laura, sister, Andrea, and brother, Richard. Also that we adjourn in memory of Diane Duncan Cornwell, a resident of Pasadena, who recently passed away at the age of 81. She attended UCLA, where she met her husband, Michael A. Cornwell. They married in 1961 and celebrated their 59th anniversary before her passing. Diane was act an active member of many organizations, such as the Pasadena Arts Alliance and the Armory Center of the Arts. She spent decades as a docent at LACMA and was the president of the docent council in the early 1980s. Diane also worked as, a, as an administrative director of the Haynes Foundation in downtown Los Angeles for 20 years until her retirement in 2007. Diane is survived by her husband, Michael, and her eldest daughter, Molly. And with that, Supervisor Kuehl, I know you'd like to say a few words. Well, it's, uh, you know, makes you feel old when people you knew in college uh, pass away. And I'm very sorry for that. I knew Diane because she was one of the original uh, student members of a project from the University Religious Conference called Project India uh, when I was working there. Uh, a wonderful young woman, and I'm certain throughout her life. So I'd like to join you if I may. Thank you. I also move that we adjourn today. We do so in memory of William Montebel, who for 32 years was a faculty member, coach, and administrator at the Antelope Valley College in Lancaster. And he died April 25th at the age of 89. Bill served in the US Air Force and earned a bachelor's degree in physical education from New Mexico A&M College and a master's degree in physical education at the University of Nevada. In 1957, Bill was hired as head coach of the basketball team at Antelope Valley College. The high point of his coaching career came in 1968 when Antelope Valley College won the state consolation, consolation championship. In 1972, Bill was promoted to Dean of Student Activities and was later named Vice President of Student Activities. He worked tirelessly to raise money for the Marauder Club, benefiting ABC Athletics. Bill is survived by his daughter, Sally Jo, stepchildren, Karen, Valerie, and Tim, several nieces and nephews, and numerous step-grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And last, with a heavy heart, um, we adjourn in memory of Sarah Zachariah, a longtime resident of Canyon Country who passed away at the age of 35. Sarah had recently given birth to her first child on February 21st. Before, sh shortly before that joyful day, she was diagnosed with stage four cancer. She grew up in Santa Clarita and attended Santa Clarita Christian School. She worked at William S. Hart Union High School District for over 10 years, where she assisted special needs students. She then went to work as an operating room clerk at All of You Medical Center, UCLA. She is survived by her husband, Michael, daughter, Sunday, her parents, four sisters, and many in the county family as well. With that, Supervisor Solis. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Bobby Lee Verdugo. Bobby Lee Verdugo was a leader in 1968 high school walkouts in the east side. He passed away from a heart attack on Friday, May the 1st of this year. He was 69 years old, born to Chicano parents in Lincoln Heights. Bobby became a key figure in the student-led effort to bring educational and policy reforms to the disenfranchised school on the east side. As a student at Lincoln High School, Bobby and several of his Latino class classmates faced physical punishment for speaking Spanish in class and discrimination from white administrators and teachers. Bobby often recalled stories of being mistreated including being paddled often in front of his peers for speaking Spanish in class. On March the 6th, 1968, Bobby decided to do something. He was among the students who led a walkout in protest because of these injustices. 
The Lincoln High School protest was part of the walkouts that week that saw thousands of mostly Latino students across the east side leaving in the middle of the school day. Fortunately for Bobby and his classmates, Lincoln High School walkout was peaceful. And at other schools, police clashed with students, bringing national attention to the cause. After <clears throat> the tumult died down, the school board met with students who called for incorporating bilingual education and an end to corporal punishment. It was the first time Latino students in Los Angeles had so forcefully and collectively used their voices to demand change. Bobby went on to attend UCLA, but before graduating, he married his high school sweetheart, Yoli Rios, in 1979, became a dad to Marcella and Monica, and settled into a career that saw him work as a bus dispatcher, a labor advocate, and a community organizer. At age 40, Bobby decided to enroll at Cal State LA to earn a degree that would allow him to become a social worker. After graduation, Bobby served as a senior program training specialist at the National Compadres Network. From 2007 to 2010, he served as a community development coordinator at Bienvenidos Family Service and was responsible for the development and coordination of the Spa 7 Community Collaborative. He also served as a lead organizer of the Obama No Yama 2008 effort in East LA that was instrumental in electing President Barack Obama in 2008. In his later years, Bobby served as a motivational speaker at colleges and university and became a figure of the often overlooked history of the Mexican American Civil Rights Movement. He is portrayed in an HBO docudrama, Walkout, and featured in the critically acclaimed PBS documentary, Chicano, The History of the Mexican American Civil Rights Movement. He'll be truly missed by his family and many on the East Side. Next, Madam Chair, I move that when we adjourn, we adjourn in memory of Mary Lou Niblock Stackhouse. Mary, Mary Lou Niblock Stackhouse of Elkhart passed away peacefully at the age of 92 on April 30th, 2020, after contracting COVID-19. Today, she would, she would have been 93 years of age. Mary Lou was born on May 12, 1927 in Elkhart at, to the late William and Francis Norcross Niblock. Her husband of 67 years, Robert Allen Stackhouse, preceded her in death. Her sister, brother, and stepsister also preceded in her death. She is survived by three loving daughters, eight cherished grandchildren, including, including Johnny Yoder, a good friend of ours who, uh, whose partner is um, Anthony Duarte, who I'm sure some of you know uh, on the line. Um, his partner, Johnny Yoder, is constituent of the first district and chief operating officer at the Art of Acting Studio Los Angeles and 10 treasured grandchildren. Mary Lou graduated from Elkhart High School in 1945, proud alumna who always looked forward to her reunion. She married her high school sweetheart, Robert, on December 29, 1946. Then they moved to West Lafayette, Indiana, where they had <clears throat> two of their three daughters. In 1950, they returned to Elkhart, where they had their third daughter. It was just three months later when they moved to California where the Stackhouse family spent more than a decade making wonderful memories and lifelong friends. They returned to Elkhart permanently in 1967. She devoted much of her time throughout her life, her life to supporting local organizations such as the Junior Chamber of Commerce in Culver City, where she helped start classes for special needs adults and the Daughters of the American Revolution, William Tufts chapter, in which she was proud. She was a proud member for 50 years. She also served for 38 years and the Elkhart General Hospital Auxiliary, where she started the Red Coats program and was president. She was an active member of Riverside Book Club and a longtime member of St. John's Episcopal Church in Elkhart. To her many friends and family, she'll be widely known as the hostess with the mostest. She will always be remembered, loved, and missed because there is no one like Mary Lou Stackhouse. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor, could I uh, join Supervisor Solis sure. on uh, that one? Thanks. Yes, Johnny's um, yeah. grandmother. Okay, so thank you. We'll take all those motions and uh, move by Supervisor Solis, seconded by Supervisor Hahn. If there are no objections to a unanimous vote, that will be the action. So that concludes today's meeting. Madam Executive Officer, please read us into closed session. 
In accordance with Brand Act requirements, notice is hereby given that the Board of Supervisors will convene in closed session to discuss item CS1, conference with legal counsel regarding anticipated litigation, and item CS2, department head performance evaluation, as indicated on the supplemental agenda. So with that, we will go into closed session. Thank you.